All right, what's up, everybody? <clears throat> Welcome. We're having fun with constant streaming. Like I said, I was getting in the mode, the attitude, the mood to do it every day. <clears throat> so we're going to test that out, see how consistent I can stick to it. As you can see, I'm in <clears throat> a very nasty, mean mode today. I told you I was going to be full of love in 2024. It's going to be the year of love. It's going to be the year of love, like Matthew McConaughey says. And I tricked you all. <laughs> it's not the year of love. It's the year of Cobra Commander. <laughs> We're going to stop the Roman Catholics. Cobra. So I got my Cobra shirt on, bro. What you going to do about that? <laughs> Ugh. Somebody's gonna uh, clip this and be like, "Look, he's wearing a satanic shirt, exposed, exposed." Cobra, the Federal Reserve. Remember the Cobra episode about Federal Reserve, dude? Cobra, Cobra was bathed and red pilled before any about everybody, anybody was. There's a whole episode about how Cobra tells everybody that the Federal Reserve is fake money. I'm 100% serious. And he says, people of America, your governments are lying to you. Your currency is worthless. And then he's going to replace it with Cobra currency. Which, by the way, is actually better than the shit coin known as the U.S. dollar. <laughs> So here we are, represent Red Pill Bazed Cobra Commander in the house. By the way, yo Joe, shit. Joe, give me a break, dude. Joe's over here uh, with Globo Skittles, right? Joe's over here trying to put freaking Lady Jane on the front lines to be in special operations. Get that out of here, dude. Although I guess technically Cobra did that too because the Baroness is on the front lines of fighting the Black Ops for Cobra. But you know what I'm saying. Whatever. In my mind, if, if Cobra calls out Federal Reserve, he's bays in Red Pill. And Joe is like freaking cucked fighting for the Fiat dollar and fighting for Hasbro and Mattel and Subway to have uh, franchises and all the other so there we go <laughs> so let's get into it today <clears throat> today I felt like uh, it was another perfect sort of springboard to talk about the issues that we've talked about many times and yet <clears throat> it still doesn't seem to sink in as you know I think maybe a year year and a half ago we had a pretty uh, intense in an intellectual sense. There was nothing uncivil about it. Everybody remember I was perfectly nice in the debate with Trent over natural theology. <clears throat> now we're not going to uh, revisit everything about that debate. We're going to pick some of the elements of that debate that maybe haven't been clearly communicated or haven't sunk in so to speak. Now, let's see. Let me get the link for y'all because I'm actually, we're actually uh, live. If you want to call in, we always have open forum. We will, after we go through some of this material, I'll open it up. To, where the heck is it at? We'll open it up for questions, comments, debates. Uh, here it is right here. So let me give you guys the link. Here's the link to the open Twitter spaces forum in the chat right here. If you want to call in, you can right there and I'll add it to the show description because everybody always, nobody ever checks show descriptions ever. Every link is always in the show descriptions. And then people come and they're like, how do I call in? What do, how do this do? What is this? What you talk about? It's in the show description, lazy bones. So a lot of things uh, <clears throat> that we discuss in the Trent debate have not sunk in. In fact, around the time of that debate, 
I mentioned Triad in passing, and Trent didn't know what I was talking about. Well, unfortunately, Trent still hasn't figured out what Triad means, which tells us a lot, and I'm not being mean, but it tells us that Trent isn't familiar with the basics of Eastern Trinitarian theology. But that's not surprising given the way that the majority of the Roman Catholic apologetic is really just trying to prove the papacy, as we've seen over and over and over. And if you didn't see last night's live stream, we did a great breakdown of the Voice of Reason versus Luigi debate, where Luigi and I, for uh, two hours, broke down that whole uh, exchange. But you'll notice here, Trent says, it's a false dilemma. I asked if, in the Old Testament, they knew that God was a trinity. A Jewish multiplicity in the Godhead could be akin to proto-Arianism. No. Um, it's not proto-Arianism. I mean, it could be all kinds of things. But the point is not whether 1st, 2nd century Jews had some kind of Benetarianism or multi. But the question is, does the Old Testament teach a triad? And then he says, you even use the word triad to describe it. But you'd say that modern people that worship triad, Jehovah's Witnesses, what? Are not worshiping the true God. So in, somehow in his mind, triad means Arianism. I don't know where he got this. Never heard this. And it just shows me that from a year and a half, two years ago, whenever we had our natural theology debate, he still hasn't understood anything about Orthodox Trinitarian theology. So it's kind of... I guess it's not surprising, but I hope that we would see some progress there. No, Trent, the word triad, if you look it up on any public explanation site, even ChatGPT knows that the word triad is just the orthodox term for trinity. I mean, in fact, Gregory Palamas has a book called The Triads, and it's about the triad <laughs> and about the energies. It's a common term. Okay, there's nothing weird, there's nothing nothing inherently Aryan about the term. So no idea where he got this. But I'm not trying to be mean, it just shows that he doesn't know the position. He doesn't understand Old Testament theology. <clears throat> and to be fair, a lot of people in the Roman Catholic natural theology tradition don't understand it. Trent seems to think that the Old Testament teaches a Unitarian deity. And he thinks this, as I pointed out, many, many times since our debate, because he said it in the debate, he thinks that he thinks that partly because that's part of the natural theology argumentation. If you read, for example, Summa Contra Gentiles 1, Aquinas will reference these types of arguments. That's the, the five-volume series that he's written against the pagans and the heathens. So it's an apologetic from natural theology to prove, quote, monotheism. And what we learn is that Aquinas thinks that the Trinity is a revelation that's rather new because of the fact that it's a New Testament Gospels and then Church Father revelation. And so he makes this argument that God first reveals himself as a kind of generic monad or unity in the Old Testament. Unit, a Unitarian type of revelation. And then it moves to Trinity and Incarnation. And this is very common in a lot of natural theological argumentation. And if we look at Nostra Aetate, which is the famous Vatican II document dealing with ecumenism, it clearly presents ecumenism on the basis of a type of common denominator, lowest common denominator, natural theology explication. For example, we read that the Muslims, we're going to use Muslims because they're a better example. Uh, scroll past the Muslims, where is it at? The church regards with esteem the Muslims. They adore the one God living and subsisting in himself. So you'll notice the reference here is to a Unitarian presupposition that we share in common with the Muslims. <clears throat> the creator who's, of heaven and earth who has spoken to men 
<clears throat> and takes pains to submit <clears throat> to his indisputable decrees as Abraham with whom the faith of Islam takes pleasure in linking itself submitted to God. So you'll notice here the, the natural theology presupposition here is that we together with Muslims share a common Abrahamic faith. This is why the Abrahamic faith center is the commonality between Roman Catholics and Muslims and Jews, a la Pope Francis's Abu Dhabi center. That's based on the accords that he signed with the imam. Remember a few years ago when Francis signed those accords that God wills all of the religions to exist. <clears throat> and people said, oh, what does that mean? Does he want false religions? And then all the uh, defenders of Pope Francis said, it just means that in God's providence, he wills them. <clears throat> but then we saw, as the conspiracy there is said, that we are vindicated because it turns out, no, <clears throat> the Abu Dhabi Faith Center was always intended to be built as an ecumenist presupposition that we all worship quote the same god so remember the abu dhabi faith center which is totally apostasy <clears throat> is premised on this it's the vatican II perennialist natural theology and we're going to see why it's perennialist in a minute <clears throat> and then we're going to contrast this with actual biblical theology and as everybody on this channel knows with all of the uh, multiple Muslim debates that we've done since 2018 with the top Muslims, all of them except one top Muslim. Muhammad Hijab is the only one we haven't debated. We've debated all the other ones. <clears throat> what have we learned? They use natural theology to argue to a generic Unitarian Allah. Exactly the same presuppositions that Trent has, exactly the same presuppositions as what is here <clears throat> in Nostra Tate. Now, First element that we see that's a problem here is that the Old Testament does not teach a generic Unitarian God. And Paul says very clearly, for example, in Galatians, that you're not the seed of Abraham because you acknowledge, quote, Unitarianism. Does Paul say that they're uh, monotheistic Abrahamic faiths because they recognize, quote, monotheism? Absolutely not. That's nowhere in the text. It's not even in the Old Testament, as we're going to see. It's an assumption that natural theology proponents make. And to be clear, people are going to say, what do you mean there's no natural theology? You don't think there's a theology of nature? Natural theology is defined in Pope John Paul's encyclical Fides et Ratio as the specific philosophizing about God and proving his existence, quote, apart from any reference to divine revelation. Go get the <clears throat> Dictionary of Natural Theology of which William Lane Craig, I think, is the editor. The first Chapter is on natural theology. William Lane Craig for the Protestant defines it exactly the same way as John Paul II does. And this is why Vladimir Lasky, for example, says, we don't do natural theology the way these people do. Because as Father Stan Eloy says in volume one of Orthodox Dogmatics, the first two pages, it's better to call it natural revelation in the Orthodox view. And that's not what natural theology is. <clears throat> natural theology is this. Lowest common denominator generic theism based around the idea that because there's some shared predicates or attributes, that is therefore the same referent. And we're going to see that that's false. Even though we could say, uh, for example, in certain texts in the New Testament, uh, Trent mentioned one in some of his tweets, we're going to look at Acts 17 and we're going to say, wait a minute, Acts, Acts 17 doesn't actually back up the natural theology argumentation. Actually, in Acts 17, backs up our position. And so it was it was surprising to me that he cited it. And I'm guessing he didn't really f get the whole force of the passage. Because when Paul says that the God that you worship as the unknown God is the true God, the point of that passage is that he's the unknown. So it's odd to me that Trent thought that was a passage that would explain that the pagans know God. When Paul calls him the unknown God. So it's a kind of a paradox, you could say, where Paul's saying that the one that you think you know, that you call unknown, is the true God. Because you don't know him. And then Trent's trying to turn that into the opposite of what it actually says. As if it means that you know the unknown God. No, no, no. It doesn't mean that. And by the way, <clears throat> we have to be clear. And I think Father Deacon Ananias and I uh, did a discussion on this. Uh, here, you'll notice this was 2021. 
we covered the Dr. Garabee paper called, uh, called Theistic Fallacies. And I referenced this in the Trent debate. Trent claimed that he had at one time read the, the paper, but he didn't remember it. I don't think that he still has understood the argumentation of this paper because the paper, as we're going to see, points out what we call the quantifier shift fallacy, which underlies a lot of the natural theology argumentation and uh, presuppositions. So we'll get to that here in a minute, and I'll talk about the Garabee paper and kind of give an overview of it as well, because once again, we're back to all the stuff that we talked about uh, you know, two, three years ago. And we're also going to walk through a lot of the texts in the Old Testament. Uh, now, I did a talk uh, four or five years ago responding to, uh, who is that goofy guy? Mr. Mr. Something. Remember him? He was like a long-haired philosophy dude, and then he decided that he wasn't libertarian conspiracy guy anymore. He became, quote, a Greek Orthodox Aryan. And he tried to gaslight everybody into saying that the Orthodox Church is Aryan. And it's like, what are you talking? Not No clue what that guy was. Mr. Uh, Mr. E? Something like that? I can't even remember his name. But I did a four-hour talk, like four or five years ago. <laughs> not as I said, Mr. Mr. Take these broken wings! And learn to fly again, learn to live so free. And when we hear the Roman heretics sing, the book of love will open up and let everybody into heaven through natural theology. No, not Mr. Mister. <clears throat> Rocking Mr. E, that was it. That's the Aryan dude. He prompted the uh, four-hour video that I did five years ago walking through the Trinity in the Old Testament. Now, guess what? Since that time, I had not read the recent Jewish scholarship admitting the multiplicity in the Old Testament. Um, I have reread the Old Testament since that time, including multiple rereadings of the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel and the Psalms and Judges and Genesis. And it turns out I missed a ton of triadic references the last go round. So I've found dozens more, literally dozens more of triadic references that I missed five years ago. So I'm going to try to, uh, I don't know how we could do that. It, it, that would actually take a whole lecture series, right? Literally, you should do triad in the Old Testament as a whole course, ideally. That's how it should be done because you would need to go deep into Genesis. There's multiple references in Genesis, even in Genesis that I missed. I mean, there's a, a theo the theophanies are part of this too, you see. So it's not just, does is there a text that says uh, Yahweh, his angel, and spirit. It's also the theophanies. And in fact, in the uh, Summers book, which was really crucial uh, to the Daniel Hakikachu debate, we saw Summers going through uh, what he called fluidity in the Old Testament. Yahweh exemplifies fluidity in the ways that he can manifest himself. And so actually throughout that... <clears throat> Uh, that book, even though he's a modern Jewish scholar, he's basically admitting theophanies, multiple hypostases. He even says that it's his argumentation is akin to the way that Trinitarian Christians speak of the, the hypostases. And it's like you read this book and you're like, OK, well, Mr. Jewish man, why would you not be a Christian if you admit all this? Exactly. Exactly. And we're going to look at some of that, but I just wanted to remind you guys that uh, we did cover the Garabi paper in detail here, and you can go watch it right here if you want to go watch that uh, discussion later. Yeah, so people are saying that they watched that old video many, many times. Well, guess what? Again, I missed I missed a bunch. And this is why the Bible is a book that's so profound and deep that you, got, you have to constantly reread it. Um, because you're, you're, there's always things that you're going to miss. And really, movies and liter literature works this way. Uh, movies work this way, right? I mean, there's movies that I've watched and, you know, maybe I've seen it three times. And then I watch it the fourth time and I'm like, dude, how did I miss that? That was crazy. That was like a huge, you know, symbolic uh, scene that I missed that was super important. And it's the same way with reading. And the other reason the Bible works that way is that, as you know, the Bible is a bunch of little books in one big book. And so the more that you imbibe sections of the book, they're going to cross-reference to other sections of the big book, you see. So because it's a holistic, unified thing, sometimes it's called, I think, canonical interpretation, 
meaning that we interpret specific sections, paragraphs, chapters in the light of the whole Bible. And we have a presupposition of narrative continuity from Genesis to uh, Revelation, right? <clears throat> So you're going to be reading parts that later jive with and uh, harmonize with other parts. And you might not pick up on details uh, until you go deeper and deeper into that text. And read it through 5, 10, 20, 100 times, right? I mean, there, there could be a lot. Somebody told me um, Garaby is not, I don't know what Garaby's views are, but I think Father Deacon emailed him, but... Anyway, um, so I don't know what his views are. I've heard somebody said he was Orthodox. Then somebody said, no, he's Catholic. Then somebody said, no, he's or, uh, not. He's Jewish. <laughs> so I don't know what his views are. But regardless, it's just a paper critiquing natural theology. And it's a, it's a w really well-written paper. And it, it basically points out um, a lot of fallacies like the quantifier shift fallacy. Um, and... Um, like the ambiguity that's involved in uh, references in terms of intentional contexts, right? So just because the same word is used, it doesn't necessarily get us to the same referent, right? And so kind of like the word concept fallacy. And I would argue that a lot of natural theology trades on a, um, uh, a version of bait and switch, where if a Muslim says, I believe in God, I believe in one God. If a Satanist says, I believe in one God, a theistic Satanist, Scientologist says, I believe there's one God somehow, and a Christian says, I believe in one God, well, they all believe in one God, so therefore they believe in the same God. That's called the quantifier shift fallacy. And it's it's basically saying that it, you're shifting the quantity referent there. So because we all have one mother, right? all humans have one mother, well, we all have the same mother. And everybody can see how that's a fallacy. It's the exact same move in natural theology. The other problem is, of course, well, there's many, but there's not a, a lowest common denominator list of attributes that necessarily gives you the true God if you remove essential attributes. For example, Muslims remove essential attributes. And I don't know if, maybe, again, the Roman Catholic apologists may not know this, but there's multiple attributes that Allah does not have that we believe God has. For example, Allah does not have sons. Well, we believe that we're God's sons. We believe that Jesus is the son of God. Well, Allah doesn't have a son, as the Quran says. So, uh, so he's not a father, is the point. Okay. We believe that uh, God is, quote unquote, the person of the father eternally generating a son. Okay, well, that's fundamentally not the Muslim view. See? And Allah is not imminent. Okay? If for most, quote, Christians, they believe in divine imminence and divine transcendence. Muslims do not believe Allah is imminent. He's not present in the world. So you start to realize that things that we assume are kind of fundamental attributes... Uh, are not fundamental. They're denied in Islam. So for removing things that are, quote, fundamental, how can the reference be the same? And you might say, well, the reference is the same in the sense of the individual intending to hit upon that thing, that God. So if a Muslim says, I believe in one God, and they intend it to be, say, for example, the God of Abraham, there might be an intention in that referent and yet it still be wrong. You see how that how that works there? This is why you could say in one sense they know God, and in another sense they don't know God. And that's what Paul does in Romans 1. So it's not a contradiction, it's two different senses of the word knowing. And a lot of times Roman Catholics will kind of trade on the equivocating and confusing of these two senses of knowing. One is a direct relational worship aspect. The other is a kind of intellectual knowledge of, right? So if you read a letter about me, you say, oh, I know that Jay guy, I read that letter about him. But you don't know me. You haven't had an intimate personal encounter with me. That's a different type of knowing. Just like, for example, the Bible says so-and-so knew his wife. Adam knew his wife, Eve. That's talking about an intimacy of sexual relations beyond just intellectual, rational knowledge of a thing. So already we can see that 
the word knowing isn't always just one sense of a uh, conceptualized. And so <clears throat> the problem is, is not <clears throat> does a Jew or a Muslim have a th abstract conceptual referent of uh, God the Father or a God, right? Because Jews might say, well, I believe in God the Father. And a Muslim might say, well, I believe in one God, the all-powerful or something like that, right? But is that, quote, enough to show that they submit to and worship the one true God? No, it's not. That's the point here. And that's why when it says the church regards with esteem the Muslims, they adore the one God, the creator, and submit wholeheartedly to his inscrutable degrees like Abraham. No, they don't. So this is moving beyond an, a, an abstracted reference to one predicate or attribute of God, which we could say is true, to now saying, no, they have a, a, an intimate relationship with that, quote, God by being part of the, quote, Abrahamic faith. There is no Abrahamic faith outside of Jesus and the Trinity. And that's why Orthodox apologists and Orthodox dogmatics in Orthodox theology, as always said, if you look at the Rublev icon, it teaches you our view. It teaches you what Abraham was up to. <clears throat> I mean, many of us have seen Sam Shamoon debate Muslims, right? Whether you're Protestant, Orthodox, or Catholic. <clears throat> How does Sam Shemun go about debating all those Muslims when it comes to Moses and the prophets? Oh, it's the same way that I debate them. And it's revolving around who was Moses, Jesus, I mean, Moses and Abraham having meals with. Every Orthodox person knows from this icon, it's a triadic relationship in the Old Testament. And no, it doesn't mean that the Father's incarnate as an angel. It means that the Logos is there as the Lord a, with two angels. And so it's symbolic of the Trinity, but it's actually one of the hypostases of the Trinity in a theophany. That's Orthodox 101. So every Orthodox person, Orthodox 101, knows by this icon that the Old Testament is triadic and not Unitarian. This is Orthodox 101. And yet we have Trent saying today, let me find the original the original comment that sparked all this off again. I got it saved here. I think it's this one. Hmm. Let's see. I don't know why it doesn't want to show up. Oh, it's because it's... Hold on. I'm going to have to do a screenshot of it and redo it. You'll see here. <clears throat> so this is uh, what Trent said today, a few hours ago. And it, again, it illustrates everything that I've been arguing. Oh, man, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. Here it is. So here's what Trent says. Yes, Muslims and Christians adore the one merciful God. So you notice he's using the language of Vatican II, the language of Nostra Tate, adoration, adore. That's worship. That's more than a mere abstracted intellectual knowledge of one of the divine attributes, such as Jews saying God is a father or Muslims saying God is the all-powerful or something. Okay, This is now in the realm of adore. We saw that Nostra Tate used the terminology of <clears throat> let's go back to Nostra Tate here uh, adore submit to same faith as Abraham the faith of Islam the faith of Abraham submitted to God Although they don't acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. Yeah, that's called Arianism. <laughs> I mean, it's a form of Arianism.
So you'll notice it's like they, they come up with this sort of scale of world religions here. Well, they get like a, a, gra a B minus on their view of Mary, uh, who's a virgin. They get a, a, a B plus because they call Jesus a prophet. It, it doesn't work like that. You understand that it only takes one uh, error on, for example, a divine attribute to cancel out that being that deity. And we know this because, for example, how does Basil argue with the Eunomians? Think of Unitarianism or Islam as basically very similar to Eunomianism. Eunomia said that Father, Son, and Spirit are really just appellations of the simple essence. And that the Son, whatever that is, is really just some other ontological creation. He was an even more radical than the Arians. Okay, So essentially, Eunomianism is the same Unitarian theology as Islam. If you saw the Jake-Dr. Branson debate, um, Jake, for example, utilized the Eunomian premise to try to make Dr. Branson into a Eunomian. So here we have Muslims utilizing Eunomian argumentation. Now, Basil engages in extensive argumentation with Eunomius, as does St. Gregor Nyssa. You can go read Basil's against Eunomius. It's about 200 pages. Nyssa's against Eunomius is about 800. <clears throat> but is there any trace in any of that whereby Basil thinks that they worship the same God? Of course not. Of course not. So you see that the whole edifice is built on tricks like, well, we use the same word. Muslims uh, uh, revere Abraham. So what? That's not good enough. And the bait and switch comes when it's not just saying, do they have an intellectual assent to or concept of one of the divine attributes? The, the, the trick comes when they flip from acknowledging that a pagan might have a knowledge, might have a, a assent to or belief in one, say, say one attribute. Like a pagan uh, says, I, I believe in Zeus is uh, the all powerful. Okay, does that then mean that he worships the one true God because he gets one attribute right? You see that you see that fallacious move? Because it moves from intellectual knowledge to relational adoration of God. That's a worship term. So for all of their sort of casuistry and sophistry, they might get out of this if they were to restrict all these statements to like conceptual knowledge. But they don't. Vatican II went even further. As far as I'm aware, there is a medieval statement. There's a letter between uh, uh, maybe a, uh, one of the sultans and a pope. Uh, I forget the letter off the top of my head. It's cited, I think, in Vatican II. When Vatican II, it might even be cited uh, in the notes to Nostratati. One of the Vatican II texts, which promotes this idea that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. It refers back to this, I don't know, I want to say like 13th century uh, letter between a sultan and a pope. And the letter says something like, well, since you and I, you know, adore the, the one true God of Abraham, uh, can we not come to blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> yeah, but <clears throat> we don't worship the same God because there's common referent. And it's very easy to show but that's not the case. But you'll notice very clearly that, I mean, just, just, let's just step back from this for a moment and, and think about the fact that, okay, this is the, the same Roman Catholic Church that called for crusades against Islam. Crusades, okay? Urban II, crusades. And now, oh, oops, sorry. We've been fighting these religious wars and thinking for centuries that these were the bad guys. Well, it turns out, no, actually, they worship the same God as us. Oh, my bad. Sorry. All that Trinity stuff. What a bunch of obnoxious, annoying theological minutia to get into Trinity and deity of Christ and, you know, all this stuff that, you mean that what Jesus talks about? No one comes to the Father but through me? And yet now we have open acceptance and promotion of the ecumenist idea on the part of the Vatican that, no, actually you can approach the Father without Jesus and the Muslims do it very well because they adore the one God. Now, 
just think how silly this is when we understand Dr. Branson's lectures. And this is what Trent doesn't understand. This is another huge element. The monarchia of the father. They're not even aware. I mean, there are, to be fair, some Roman Catholic texts that will admit the principal role of the father as the source. But what you see here in uh, Vatican II's document is an exemplification of what I think is a rival tradition within the Latin West of that absolute divine simplicity, the assumption that I can reason to an absolutely simple essence on the basis of certain attributes apart from Trinity, apart from Jesus, apart from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I can get generic simplicity, uh, omniscience, omnipotence, uh, uh, one, non-composite. Those are all the natural theology attributes that I can somehow get to apart from divine revelation through reason alone. Okay, do you understand? People don't even understand what natural theology is. First of all, they think it's, if you remember the debate, Trent shifted between about three different senses of what he thought natural theology was. He thought using apologetic arguments at all was, quote, natural theology. No, no, no. No, and I even sent to him before the debate the very definition of what we would be debating. John Paul II's definition of natural theology in Fides et Ratio that it's reasoning about God apart from divine revelation. William Lane Craig, Dictionary of Natural Theology, has the exact same definition. So between Protestants and Roman Catholics, there's no dispute as to what natural theology is. So natural theology is not using reason at all. It's not using logic. It's not using evidences. None of those things are the definition of natural theology, which is what we were debating. And Trent said, well, if you're using reasoning at all, that's natural theology. No, it's not. <laughs> it's, that's why I defined what we're debating. And you agreed to that definition in the emails. So natural theology is, again, premised on the assumption that because there's some things in common, then the reference is the same. And the intention of the reference might be the same. But that doesn't mean that the individual has therefore established a personal relationship with that referent just because they even have the intention the same. And I gave the example of, uh, let's say that I, I give you a, a list, a, a buried treasure. I have, uh, 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 I was going to say gold. I was going to say Bitcoin, but let's say gold. Okay, I, I buried 25 bars of gold and I buried it in uh, the promised land and uh, I'm going to give you some other clues it's um, you're going to go into a wooded area and it's uh, it's off the beaten path and if you go to the promised land and you search in the basement of a building you're going to find this 25 bars of gold buried there and you say aha uh, I have some good ideas and even if I don't know for sure it's worth it to spend the next two years um, fly, I'm going to fly over to Israel. I'm going to search for all, all the basements in, in wooded areas outside of the city. And you go and you search and you search and you come back five years later after searching. It's been, you say, Jay, you, you, you told me, you told me that the promised land was, was where you buried your 25 bars of gold. And, and the, the, uh, prospector, it's Nick Cage on his national, next national treasure event adventure, right? He says, Jay, I went to the promised land. I searched every freaking basement, okay? There's no gold buried in any basement in Israel. And I say, ah, oh, Nick, Nick, my friend. Yes, even though you had the intention, the correct intention, to go to the referent that I had, that I gave you. My friend, I meant the promised land Christian bookstore down the road from where I live. So you notice that he had the right intention to go for what I intended. The referent was identically promised land. But the referent was wrong, even though he had the right intention. So just because a Muslim has the intention that his predicates, that his sentences match up to the one, quote, true God. If Jesus tells us that the one true God is reached through him and only through him 
then adoring one attribute is not enough, is the point. And if that's the case, then this whole edifice of natural theology falls apart. Furthermore, as Garabi argues forcefully at the beginning of the paper, he completely takes Richard Swinburne to task. Because Richard Swinburne claims to be orthodox, some sort of convert from Thomism, and Richard Swinburne thinks that there's a lowest common denominator of attributes where you just list out about 10 of them, and that's the one true God that we all share in common. And that therefore we could build a sort of a ecumenist dialogue off of that. However, the perennialist John Hick, I think, if I remember, he makes the argument that, well, wait a minute, why does do those attributes have to get you to the commonality between Christian Jews and Muslims that somehow leads you into Christianity, Judaism, or Islam? Why wouldn't the commonality speak to a perennialist true religion, which is more universal over those three, you see? In other words, it's a non sequitur to say that it necessitates you to move into either Judaism, Christianity, or Islam because there's commonalities. When if you say that there's commonalities, the real true religion, you could just as easily argue, is the perennialist commonalities, the lowest common denominator. And by the way, why is it only the common denominator ones that Swinburne lists? Maybe there's five attributes that's the real lowest common denominator. Do you see how silly this is? Then we could get into the, the point that I made to Trent again. Well, now, wait a minute. <clears throat> if all it takes is the same intended referent of a, quote, unified deity, then it seems to follow that if a Christian, if a Scientologist and a theistic Satanist all say, I worship one deity, then they all worship the same deity. But that, again, is the quantifier shift fallacy, as I pointed out right here. So do we see how all of these moves don't work? And they're all premised, not actually, I mean, I think sometimes people are making mistakes about genuinely wanting to understand this or that verse. I mean, I used to believe in natural theology at one time, too. I thought, okay, maybe Thomas Aquinas is right, and that, you know, the Thomistic position has a good account of that. So I thought these things as well. So I understand the thinking process. But what really got me out of all this was, number one, of course, orthodox theology. But even understanding it in a more clear way, getting into anti-Islamic apologetics. And I'm going to let uh, Father Deacon's going to join us here in a minute. We're going to open it up here in a minute. But let's go back to my opening statement to Daniel Hakikachu in our debate. And keep in mind that the very arguments that I'm making against Daniel are the same arguments that I'm making against Trent and his natural theology. How is this not like obvious and mind-blowing to people that <laughs> natural theology is false? <laughs> I mean, look, what do we say to Daniel? Let's go back to, it's not that long. We're going to play this and co comment on it. This was the opening statement because remember, Daniel's argument was, I mean, I, went, I think I went first, but his argument is going to be that the, the religion of the Old Testament prophets, that was the premise of our debate, is the, is the uh, uh, religion of Moses and the prophets Unitarian or Trinitarian? That was the premise of, who's the, in continuity with the prophets, uh, Islam or Christianity? <clears throat> so let's listen to some of this uh, debate, and we're going to look at <clears throat> what Jewish scholarship nowadays admits. Could a 7th century Jew or Christian verify the Quranic claims? In the Quran, many places we're told that its hearers and readers should go to the Torah and to the Injil or the Gospel. This assumes a degree of continuity which could only be validated with the existing manuscripts and textual traditions that are already possessed by both Jews and Christians in the previous centuries. As laid down in a divine revelation in Deuteronomy 13 and 18, any subsequent prophetic revelation must meet the test of consistency with prior revelation. This here uh, would refer to the prior existing Torah, whether oral or written, including a subsequent divine revelation found in the wisdom texts, the historical books, liturgical texts, and the major and minor prophets. Islam and the Quran do not merely contradict prior revelation in a few minor areas, but rather gigantic portions of the Torah and the prophets are discarded 
due to obvious contradictions, inaccuracies, and inconsistencies with the Quranic account. Deuteronomy 13 and 18. Now you're going to be, you might be wondering, I'm going to skip past the Deuteronomy text because they're not that relevant to <clears throat> uh, the continuity. I'm going to move on to this next slide. If you're wondering why I'm playing this, it's again to stress, and I mentioned this in the in the debate with Trent. Remember I said, Trent, how do you, how do you argue against Muslims? Like, have you not had, I mean, I don't know if he, maybe he hasn't had any Muslim debates. I don't know. But if you do begin to have Muslim debates, you're going to learn very quickly that the best way to undercut Islam is to point out that the Old Testament is not Unitarian, Trent. So if you're going to have the same presuppositions as the Muslim, and Muslims believe in natural theology, by the way, just like Roman Catholics do, you already have surrendered a tremendous refutation of Islam by pointing out that the Old Testament is triadic and all about Jesus. And that's not a Christian reinterpolation of the Old Testament. That's the intention of the Old Testament itself. Not a, quote, rabbinical book. And the Jewish scholarship, by the way, that I mentioned in my opening statement, guess what it points out about rabbinical theology? The strict Unitarian enforcement on Judaism is a late rabbinical mandate. We're talking Maimonides. Now, that doesn't mean that no Jewish rabbinical texts prior to Maimonides were Unitarian. But it means that there was a lot of dispute, discussion, debate about in what way and how Yahweh was, quote, fluid, you could say, according in uh, Summers' text, or multiple. And there were different uh, ideas on this. Okay, There was Binitarianism. There was a kind of Trinitarianism. And we'll see that here in a minute in my opening statement. And you're going to notice how devastating this is to Trent's presuppositions, because he has the same presuppositions. There is no light in them. The next uh, thing that has to be shown, which I may cause uh, some people some surprise, uh, is that the Old Testament prophets were Trinitarian. They were not Unitarian. Judaism, specifically in the Second Temple period, was not a monolithic Unitarian enterprise. The question becomes, what are the teachings of the prophets at, uh, in the Old Testament? Did they uh, actually teach, as Islam says, a radical Unitarianism? Or is it something more fluid, or is there differentiation in Yahweh? In fact, modern Jewish scholarship unanimously is, un, uh, is undecided on this question. There's a lot of Jewish scholarship that is uh, listed here. For example, Daniel Boyarin. Uh, later, I have Summer, and I have uh, Siegel. And they admit that in the Old Testament itself, not due to Christian deviation, but in, in the Old Testament itself, we find many, many passages that show uh, differentiation in Yahweh. That differentiation is not just uh, located in rabbinic debates, it also continues into later medieval debates with Jewish Kabbalah, and you can see there, for example, Gershom Sholem in his uh, book on Kabbalah, he's the uh, respected Kabbalist uh, uh, theologian of the Middle Ages, or uh, scholar of, of medieval Kabbalah. He points out, for example, the three beginningless lights that are mentioned. Now, I'm not a Kabbalist, I'm just pointing out that this shows that the Jewish tradition... Yeah, and by the way, so I'm sure that the uh, right-wing goobers are going to freak out here and clip me like they did last time and say, He's a Kabbalist! He's promoting Kabbalist! <laughs> no, I'm not a Kabbalist, okay? The only reason I'm, I'm referencing the Kabbalistic debates are precisely because Kabbalistic rabbinical scholars were trying to figure out in what way God is multiple. J just showing that there were rabbinical debates even into the Middle Ages about this very question. That's the only point I'm making. And then a bunch of liars are like, oh, look, see, he's promoting Kabbalism. <laughs> no, did you know Kabbalism, according to Sholem, is just Neoplatonism and Gnosticism in Judaism? That's all it is. Now, <clears throat> that's a broad term, Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. It doesn't mean that all of the discussions that they were having were, quote, Gnostic and Neoplatonic. It just means that it's similar and they were borrowing the models and structures uh, of Neoplatonism and so forth to try to make sense of what, in what ways uh, God manifests himself in the world. Now, sometimes the Kabbalists got into these crazy magical texts, superstitions. Sometimes they got into these weird uh, ideas that evil is good and good is evil. Yes, I'm aware of all of that in Kabbalism. I knew about that 20 years ago. 
Uh, but that's not the point that I'm making here in this argument. The point is just simply to say that this shows us that Judaism was not a monolithic Unitarian system, even into the Middle Ages. This really begins with Maimonides and his, his attempt to make it strictly Unitarian. Okay, And even in his day, there's debate like Nachmanides, who is the Kabbalist rabbi, versus Maimonides, who is the rationalist Unitarian Aristotelian rabbi. Even at that time, they're still debating. Okay. So it takes a long time for Judaism to be strictly, explicitly hardcore Unitarian. And that undercuts the Muslim and natural theology argumentation that the Old Testament was Unitarian and early Jewish Christian debates were Trinitarian versus Unitarian. No, they weren't. That's the point. And it's very important to point this out because now it undercuts not just Islam, but the stupid argument of the natural theologian proponents who argue that the Old Testament Unitarian. That's the whole point of this argument. And this is not me making, this is recent normative Jewish scholarship. Boyarin, Siegel, Summers, they're all Jewish. They're all rabbinical teachers. It's not monolithic in its presentation. So. Uh, I'd like to come back then to uh, my screen, uh, to me here, and point out that the first display of Trinitarian theology in the Law and the Prophets is, for example, here on this whiteboard. And I'm showing this whiteboard because, hopefully you guys can see this, uh, this is a tremendous amount of text. And I'm just citing these because there's too many to fit on uh, a single screen there with uh, typing it all out. You can screen. So <clears throat> because there's so many theophanies and references to the triad in the Old Testament, I had to kind of pack it on the white, this giant whiteboard and freeze it because I didn't have a way to list them all. I mean, I could have listed them all in a, a, a slide or something, but I thought the, I thought the whiteboard made it more kind of effective. You know what I mean? So you can screenshot that if you want. Unfortunately, you can't see all of this. It's cut off, but um, I have a talk from four or five years ago about Trinity in the Old Testament. We can find that as well. I should probably just re redo all this and just lecture through every one of these texts. Maybe that's the best way to do it and, uh, you know, get them all out there and do like, I don't know, a course on it or something. But we need some kind of course on this, the Trinity in the Old Testament, because uh, more and more and more we're starting to see these lunatic, uh, you know, like Unitarian things, crazy Hebrew Israelites, Arianism uh, making a comeback on the Internet with all these online idiots everywhere. I was on the freaking plane uh, from back from LA and I had a damn we was Kang's uh, brother next to me watching we was Kang's videos Father Deacon did you want to say something? Well, yeah, where do you, I mean obviously the internet's facilitating this yeah um, But let's just think about how is this happening? I mean, is this I mean is it kind of the natural consequence of uh, Solomea that the by myself, I'm trying to search for some sort of authenticity, so I go back and I uh, construct this kind of Unitarianism or Hebrew roots, or, I mean, obviously, like I said, the internet lets this spread, but what do you think's kind of the, the source of this? I think there could be also, you know, Fed support. I mean, a lot of this stuff is crazy. It seems to come out of nowhere. I mean, who knows, right? I mean, there's there's... I mean, Dale Tuggy has been pushing Unitarianism for a long time. Dr. Branson's sort of his chief critic. So I think uh, ideally we, we'd like to see a uh, Dale Tuggy, uh, Dr. Branson debate. Maybe that'll happen one day, but I don't think Dale, Dale Tuggy wants to do that. Uh, I think he's, I mean, he doesn't even want to debate me. He says, cause I'm, I'm a, a controversial and offensive or whatever he says, but um, you know, Dr. Branson would, would fare a lot better than you. Yeah, and he would do great. He would be a much better uh, person to debate. But let's get back to this real quick. So notice all these texts here uh, on screen. And I think in the future, uh, maybe Father Deacon, you can join me in some others. We, we'll we'll try to address some of these Hebrew roots things that are getting uh, more popular and, and growing. And again, if I'm on an airplane and the, and the brother next to me is playing We With Kang's videos, like this stuff is spreading. So, and I'm, I'm sure the internet, they're like, I'm sure entities are promoting it on the internet on purpose so i'm sure they're getting algorithmic help with all this just crazy nonsense but 
We do need to talk about this stuff because you'll notice part of it too. This is off off topic. Somebody asked me, did you cover uh, the event in Russia? I did. So again, go to my Twitter and uh, I've got, I did a two hour talk with Patrick Henningsen, Syrian girl. Uh, I did a whole uh, hour with Jack Posobiec and Alex Jones. So you can go watch that on Twitter. Can't put it on YouTube. Obviously they're not going to allow that. So, um, but you'll notice a lot of black people are waking up to stuff. Uh, we've seen Candace, we've seen uh, Kanye, even though Kanye seems to be backing away from Christianity. Uh, we've seen uh, Ice Cube coming, starting to admit and notice some things. We've seen uh, Cat Williams talking about. So I, there's this, you know, black people are kind of figuring things out in a good way. But then they're kind of being offered all of these just ridiculous cul-de-sacs of insane cults to go into. So I think I think maybe they don't want black people waking up to too much. And so they're giving them these crazy cults and groups to kind of corral them into so they don't become effective. Because as soon as you get into some ridiculous Hebrews, Hebrew Israelite cult, uh, you're going to be completely ineffective. In fact, um, a couple of the rappers who left the circles of um, Diddy uh, ended up getting into some of the stupid nonsense. So... Exactly. So a good point, uh, by the way, uh, chatter. There's somebody in the chat pointed out that one of the big uh, black YouTube channels, Gideon, he converted to some form of Arianism. Um, Bryson Gray pushes Arianism. So all of these black people that are kind of waking up to certain things are then going into these ridiculous heresies like Bryson Gray promotes. Speaking of, it's really funny. Uh, I had to block him because... Um, I'm not supposed to be debating during Lent, um, but Bryson was actually trying to debate me just now on Twitter. Oh wow! Yeah, um, and I'm like, why? Why am I going to debate you when Jay destroyed you in the debate? Oh no, he didn't. That's a bunch of a uh, bunch of words, no meaning. I'm like, you know where we hear that phrase <laughs> from the atheist clowns? Anything I don't like is meaning. Is word salad, yeah. Is word salad and meaningless, but I mean, everybody saw that debate. Talk about Dunning Kruger, as somebody points out in the chat. Um, well, uh, so committed and so, ins- you know, uh, yeah. prideful. Well, you know, he took a lot of quizzes, though, right? So, you know how many Bible quizzes he passed? Oh, is that the, was that the, is that what he said? I forgot about that. No, he actually says that. Yeah, he's like, how, how many Bible quizzes you take? How many Bible quizzes you take? I'll pass them all. And I said, I, and I talked about fallacies. He said, what that is, what that is, what that is. That's your response when I call it a fallacy. <laughs> anyway, uh, all right, let's get back to this uh, real quick here. Uh, let me get through the uh, the opening statement to Muslim Daniel Hakikachu, and we're going to see how it applies to Trent. Let me this later and go check the, the various textual references here for just examples of theophanies. And I, the reason I've included the theophanies, is that these are particularly useful for demonstrating the manifestation of Yahweh in the Old Testament, proving differentiation. So not just Yahweh, but also the angel messenger that he sends, who has the name of Yahweh, as we read in Exodus, the same angel that's present in the burning bush. That angel is spoken of as the uh, messenger of the covenant. He's spoken of as, in Judges, turning the face of Yahweh towards Gideon in Judges 6. And many, many other passages where he's identified, for example, in Judges 13 as the uh, angel of wonderful counsel. <clears throat> so you can check those references later, or we can go back to any of those. And so let me go back to my screen share here and point out that the uh, triad there, I don't mean to argue either that the Old Testament explicitly uses the, word, the words triad. No, all that's necessary, as the Jewish scholars are admitting, is that the uh, the Old Testament believers spoke of Father, Angel of the Lord, or Son of Man, and the Spirit in a real distinctive way. This is really important. Everybody, please get this point. Because Trent didn't understand it. <clears throat> Many Roman Catholics that I've made this uh, uh, dis- had this discussion with, and even some of the Muslims, have not understood this. The, you do not have to know the word Trinity to believe in the Trinity. Okay, And that might sound a little weird if you first hear that. But we are not saying that Abraham had a mental conception of the Nicene definition of the Trinity. Okay, we're not saying that. He doesn't have to. 
what he has to have a conception of, and what he does have a conception of is Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, his messenger, who has Yahweh's name in him and who is worshipped, who is the Messiah, and the Spirit. And when we understand, for example, that Abraham had a meal with Jesus, that Jacob wrestled with Jesus, that Moses went up on the mountain and ate a meal with Jesus, it's starting to become a little clear. Oh, now I see. It's Jesus that appears to Samson's parents, to Manoah. It's Jesus yeah, can that... I, can I add something there? Sure. I'm kind of tying it into the Garaby paper. Sure. Yeah. Um, again, I like what you're saying, that clearly uh, we don't have with the, the Old Testament prophets uh, a nice scene worked out conception of the trinity but it, it should be very clear it's not a strict uh, monotheism and monad and furthermore um as the garaby paper points out and because we were talking about a reference when we use the term god what is it referred to does it refer to some strict uh monad or generic is this what the uh, prophets and patriarchs of the old testament uh is that what it was referring to um, no, as the Garaby paper points out, and I write my papers, that the referent is conditioned by the paradigm, uh, by the faith in its entirety, such that the individual doesn't have to have a worked out list of uh, properties and, and various things. Or, um, so that when they're referring to God, how do I know it hits it? Again, this is to conceive of everybody's out on their own developing their kind of own meanings of words. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to understand that, no, it's conditioned by the entire paradigm, the revealed faith. Um, think about it this way. The children in the Orthodox Church, in the services, yes, and they're praying to God. Great point. Do not have a worked out Nicene, um, profound theological, well, who are they praying to? They're praying to the Trinity. Yes. Now, how is that possible? Exactly. It's possible because they're baptized and grafted into the faith as a whole, the Catholicos, the conditions, the meaning and reference of that term God. So the same thing with the with the patriarchs of old in the Old Testament. Um, they don't have to have a Nicene worked out. Clearly, like I said, it's not a strict monotheism, but the reference is established by God and his divine revelation such that the, it determines the reference to be the Trinity, um, despite the inadequacies of our language or intellectual abilities. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's another way to illustrate the same point to Trent is that Trent, right, uh, intellectual conceptualization of the Trinity via uh, nicene constantinopolitan Creed is not what we're saying is the thing that makes you quote Trinitarian. And that's what he really can't fathom because he's restricting. And I think he said something uh, or, or him, maybe somebody else said something like, oh, so you're saying that in the Old, in the Old Testament, they knew uh, the, the you know, homoousias. I mean, this is, they were saying, oh, it's crazy. No, no, obviously they wouldn't know those terms, but they don't have to because it's what Jesus explains here. And you'll notice this is right after he had done this healing on the Sabbath, right? They sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. And Jesus replied to them in John 5, uh, My father has been working until not now, and I have been working. The context is Sabbath and violating the Sabbath by working. And the point is that, well, now, wait a minute. God the Father established the Sabbath at the creation week, right? Jesus is assuming his uh, Pharisee opponents also believe that. And he says, but wait a minute. Do you understand that God the Father has been working also? And I have been working. Since the Sabbath, since the creation of the world in the seventh day back in Genesis. So Jesus is equating himself to the same works as the Father from the time of, of Genesis up. In other words, I'm co-equal to the Father. That's what 17 means. And then the Jews sought all the more to kill him because they correctly perceived that he was making himself, quote, equal to God. Verse 18. So you understand that Jesus is saying that I was doing all of those works in the Old Testament. And then he goes on to talk about how that's why everybody in the world will be judged through me. 
And then he talks about various Old Testament witnesses. And as you know, from John 5 all the way to John 9, there's multiple discourses and discussions, particularly uh, chapter 8, where Jesus explains that Moses wrote about him. Right here. I've come in my Father's name, but you don't receive me. But if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? I'm talking about God the Father, by the way. That's monarchical Trinitarianism. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There's one that accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. But if you believe Moses, you would believe in me because Moses wrote about me. The writings of Moses are about Jesus. Why is that? Because, as Peter says, it's the Spirit of Christ that inspired the prophets to write. Moses is writing by the Spirit of Christ, is what Peter says. And how is he doing that? Because Jesus is the one that talked to Moses on the mountain. That's the whole point of John 5 through 9. So ironically, we're dealing with people who are not just making Muslim arguments, they're making like the Pharisee arguments. <laughs> That's how silly this is. <clears throat> Jesus says that Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Now, <clears throat> that means that just from that passage, we at least know that Abraham knew of the father and the son. And we know from other passages that it's clearly Jesus that Moses is, or that Abraham, excuse me, is having his meal with. And when we find out in Genesis that there's references to the spirit, we can deduce that Abraham thus had a knowledge of God the Father, Yahweh, his angel, Lord, messenger that he met with and ate with, and this person of the Holy Spirit, who also appears throughout Genesis do you see this? So a lot of this also, uh, and I don't mean this in an arrogant way, but a lot of this comes from ignorance of the Old Testament, ignorance of what the, the texts actually say. And this, by the way, is ironically, I mean, it's not ironic that Sham, Sam Shamoon is good at debating Muslims, but just go watch a bunch of Sam Shamoon's debates with Muslims. He's almost always arguing Old Testament passages when they talk about Unitarianism to make the very points that you hear me making. How would that be possible? But and this is the next point. I remember I wanted to say. The other point I wanted to say too is, uh, it's also not the case, by the way. Think how silly this is. Think about, so would we want to really argue that the only knowledge of the Trinity comes when the Trinity is formulated? Wait a minute, really? Are we, are we sure we want to go with that stupid argument? Because if that's the case, then the Gospels aren't teaching the Trinity. Because the Gospels are prior to the Nicene definition or Tertullian's term Trinitus, whatever, whatever point you want to pick in church history where you think the Trinity is, quote, first taught. And by the way, that's the Muslim argument. Constantine teach Trinity. Uh, Tertullian make up Trinity. Right? They, they have these silly arguments, right? That it's made up. Well, wait a minute. If that's the case, then why were the church fathers appealing to the Old Testament and the gospel to prove the Trinity? All you have to do is ask Trent, Trent, who, what are they appealing to to prove it? Oh, the Old Testament. Has anybody read Trifo? Uh, St. Justin against Trifo the Jew? It's one of the first things I read from the Church Fathers back in 2003. Guess what Justin does throughout that apologetic treatise? Oh, the very things that we do. He goes to Theophanies and he proves the Trinity in the Old Testament to Trifo. And that's prior to Nicene definition of Trinity. Yes, I'm aware that Theophilus talks about the Trinity prior to Tertullian. I'm just saying it doesn't matter which post-apostolic person you pick that uses the term Trinitas. It's ridiculous to think that we don't know about the doctrine of the Trinity until somebody uses the term Trinity. It's just so silly. And I prove that by pointing out that the, the apologists post-apostles who defend the Trinity prove it from where? The Gospels and the Old Testament. And guess what? When you go to the Gospels to prove the Trinity, especially the book of John, where does Jesus argue the Trinity from? The Old Testament. <laughs> it's all through the Gospel of John. Anyway. 
Yes, I am. <clears throat> and then thank you to Giob and others in the chat. Uh, yes, the, the St. Theophilus is good. Uh, many, many of the early church fathers basically bear out all these points. Um, anyway, so let's move on to the rest of this uh, talk here. Uh, and then we'll kind of open it up pretty soon here. Uh, but I want everybody to understand, again, notice the pattern of Trent making the same arguments from the Muslim position with the same presuppositions as the Muslims. And they do. Although many in modern uh, in modernity assume that the law and the prophets were strictly Unitarian, Jewish scholar Daniel Buaren notes that early Christianity actually represents a conservative form of Judaism that sought to remain faithful to the totality of Revelation and the law and the prophets, including the texts which are portray uh, differing his, uh, hypostases in God. Another. Now, that's a really uh, powerful admission. And again, uh, when I debated, I think, uh, I think Daniel said this and then Jake repeated this as if they know I wasn't arguing that Boyarin is a Christian. This is so stupid. Like they're like, Jay thinks that Boyarin is some kind of Christian. Right. Remember when Jake was making this kind of heated argument, acting all ridiculous. I didn't argue that. I said that Boyarin says that early Christianity is a quote conservative form of Judaism seeking to remain faithful to the multiplicity of Yahweh taught in the law and the prophets. That's all I said. Buyarin uses the term hypostasis. Uh, no, excuse me, Summers does. That's all I said. I didn't say Buyarin is a Christian and Jews are now admitting that we're all Christian. Just total straw men. By the way, uh, did you like my Jake impression? <laughs> Jay thinks that Boyarin was some kind of Christian. Remember? Remember Jake getting all like animated. He was spurging out over there. Dude, Jake had like Parkinson's all of a sudden for that debate. I don't know. Sit still, dude. Chill out. Anyway, let's let's move on. Revelation and the Law of the Prophets, including the text which are portray uh, differing his uh, hypostases in God. Another example of this is a recent Jewish scholarship on divine fluidity and divine embodiment in the Law and the Prophets. Now, again, I'm not Jewish. I'm just pointing out that the admissions of Jewish scholarship are to our position nowadays. We are in, in the Jewish Gospels, the story of the Jewish Christ notes, for example, just from the example uh, from the, the text of Daniel 7. By the way, the Peter Schaefer text was an, I couldn't think of the other text. Uh, Schaefer is the other one I'm trying to think of. We have the discussion of the Messiah being divine. The Messiah being in human form, the Messiah appearing as younger than the Ancient of Days, uh, the divinity of Ancient of Days. We have the Messiah appearing uh, uh, eventually enthroned upon high and being given dominion and authority over earth. That is the, ascent, the, the ascension in, in Christian theology. Now, uh, early on in uh, the early days of Christianity, there were already rabbinical debates before Christianity and rabbinic Judaism uh, completely parted ways where you even have people like famous rabbis like Rabbi Akiva, for example, admitting that there is multiplicity in some sense in the Godhead. This is covered in Alan Siegel's Two Powers in Heaven and in Schaefer's Two Gods in Heaven. Now, God is a generic term that can uh, pick out a specific hypostasis, and it can also pick out a generic nature. So when it says two gods or two powers, it's not indicating polytheism. It's merely indicating differentiation in the text. Now, again, I'm by the way, did you notice that, what I just said there? That undercuts the whole bunch of nonsense that Jake tried to hinge the entire argument on about Jake believes in two gods, little G. Right? Remember that? I just explained what that means right there. And it doesn't mean what he... That's polytheism! I'm not arguing for Kabbalah. I'm just pointing out as an example that rabbinic Judaism is not a monolithic Unitarian philosophy. As Summer notes... This is a later Maimonidean feature and not a Kabbalistic or uh, early Christian Judaic feature. Second Temple Judaism in, Christian, uh, in Jewish scholarship was not monolithic. It was not radical Unitarian. It was fluid, and it did not admit God to be multiple due to later accretions. In fact, uh, Siegel and Summers and other admit that you can have a multiplicity of personae. Now, I point this out because this is a Muslim approach where they will say, yeah, okay, maybe a lot of uh, Jewish scholarship is admitting that there's fluidity here in the notion of Yahweh and him being not a strictly Unitarian thing, but this was a, quote, late accretion. But no, they don't, they don't say that. It's not a rabbinical corruption of the text. It's the texts themselves that have multiplicity in them. 
And what does that multiplicity mean? Well, it's a multiplicity of persons. That's what Christians teach. That's what Jesus is saying when he says that he receives from the Father, that he prays to the Father. He loves the Father. Because that's two distinct type of stasis. In early Jewish theology, without that, necessitating, for example, multiple wills. This is also seen in the process of the rabbis in their eventual exclusion of Logos theology, which is not a direct import from Hellenism per se, but rather from the wisdom text of the Old Testament, the Solomonic literature and so forth. Jewish scholars like uh, Simeon Halevi, Sholem, Weyaren, Siegel, and Sommer admit that rabbinical dialogues and debates on the wisdom Logos text and the Merkabah chariot mysticism that draws from both the Psalms, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Enochic literature all posit various divine embodiments, manifestations, and even incarnation. Now, did you notice that, how crucial that is? In other words, even these modern Jewish scholars who don't believe Christianity are admitting that, look, the texts of Psalms, Daniel, Ezekiel, the Enochic literature, going in, you can go back to Genesis, Judges, they're admitting a fluidity in the way that God manifests himself in time and space. And the manifestation of God in time and space does not compromise his unity, his simplicity, his sovereignty, uh, his you know omnipotence, etc., etc., etc. All of those things are what's in the text. That's the, the kind of God that, that is revealed to us. And he can come in a kind of, quote, form. What? God has a form? Yes, that's why throughout the Law and the Prophets, Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on a throne in Isaiah 6. And John says in John 12 that that's Jesus. So Isaiah sees Jesus. I mean, if you've read Isaiah, and by the way, I just reread Isaiah recently, I'm again reminded of why it's called the fifth gospel. Do you realize that giant portions of Isaiah are just about Jesus and the church? Chapter after chapter? Do you realize that not just multiple messianic prophecies about where Jesus will be born, uh, who his uh, bloodline descendant would be from David, etc. All of that, as well as countless prophecies of the church, the Gentile church. In fact, ancient rabbinical dialogues discuss the divine Messiah suffering, dying, and perhaps even atoning. One example is Rabbi Hagalili and Boyarin's Jewish Gospels discussing the atoning death. Uh, and then my friend, uh, the Jewish Messianic Christian, Ken Ami, has a book, Jewish, uh, The Jewish Messiah is a, is a Judaism versus Judaism debate. Yeah, this is important because, uh, as Ken points out in his book, he's got a ton of quotes from how, I mean, everybody has this impression that like first, second, third century Judaism was like this monolithic, uh, everybody had the same view as like Maimonides. Like they, that's the assumption that everyone has. Oh, Judaism is Unitarian. You could go to the Jewish Encyclopedia and look up Theophanies, look up the Shekinah. They were debating into the Middle Ages what the Theophanies were. Some of them said it's an angel. Some of them said it's Metatron. Some of them said it's the essence of God in time and space. Don't ask me how that's possible. But if you read the uh, Summers book, he basically says the essence energy distinction. I mean, he comes like this close to saying that the way that the, the theophanies are possible is the essence energy distinction. So basically saying that the theophanies are all throughout the Old Testament. It's not an angel. It's some way in which the form of Yahweh is manifest. That's Jesus. Again, just illustrating that Judaism is not a monolithic enterprise. Now, as uh, we get back to embodiment, Jewish scholar Benjamin Sommer notes in his Law and the Prophets that they themselves, in many texts that I cited in my uh, big whiteboard there, display what he calls fluidity of Yahweh's ability to be both imminent and transcendent, as well as manifesting at certain times and in certain places. In special and uh, keep in mind, Muslims do not believe that God is imminent. Okay, there's no God in time and space at all. So that's a fundamental attribute that Christianity believes, that God is present, he's imminent in the world, that Muslims deny. Special modes and in special presences. This does not entail or necessitate a change in Yahweh's essence or nature, but rather that he's able to be embodied or to manifest in various and distinct ways. Summer even admits the dispute. That's the terminology of Summer, by the way. That's not my argumentation. That's the way Summer argues his explanation 
of Yahweh's manifestations in the Old Testament. Which, again, it's like, well, dude, why are you not a Christian? Exactly. Yeah, it was not over a strict numerical oneness, because many people in the ancient world did not always count by strict identity, but rather by division. Whether this distinction, the hypostasis, allow for multiple wills is the real issue, according to Summer. And that, of course, is something... Note that I threw that in there in the Daniel debate, that the ancient world typically counted by division and not by identity. Uh, that was already in the day, but they don't, these people don't pay attention. Muslims have no interest in being precise and paying attention to what you're actually, very few of them. Uh, Dr. Khalil does, so to be fair to Dr. Khalil, Khalil, he cares. But most of the online goobers in the Muslim world, they don't care what you said. And that Trinitarians reject, we do not believe in multiple wills in the Godhead. Summer cites many of the holy places and iconography, iconography replete throughout the Old Testament law and prophets including altar stones, trees, which are dedicated to Yahweh. Uh, uh, they're made holy in anticipation of the temple and tabernacle liturgical services, which will also embody Yahweh above the ark, the Shekinah, and so forth, the cloud, while at the same time not embodying the divine essence. Or By the way, I, I, don't, I haven't read the scholarship on this, but I will bet you money that the Islamic idea of Allah above the throne uh, I bet you it comes from their misunderstanding of these texts where Yahweh is above his chariot throne, the ark in the temple, or what you see in the Ezekiel 1 to 10 texts. I bet you money that that's where they got that misunderstanding from. Anyway, altering Yahweh. This, as a side note, the Quran also appears to have inadvertently left these references to this special presence in texts like uh, Surah 6, 71 to 80, 1171 to 51, 28. So in other words, the Quran compilers were so stupid that they didn't realize that these are theophanies in the Old Testament. So they just put it in there and bypassed even trying to make sense of, well, now, wait a minute. How is Allah present? And by the way, there's actual texts that reference, I mean, there's references to theophanies in the Bible that are in the Quran, which are clearly the angel of the Lord. You see how silly this is? Like that, that's not possible in Islam. Allah is not in time and space. There's no theophanies. You understand that? Now, uh, the challenge then, as I would put it to Daniel, would be to leave him. All right, so we're going to stop there because the rest of my talk there is not about uh, the theophanies or anything in the Old Testament. I don't think there's anything else in there about that. Let me see. Um, I just wanted, I, I, just, I went on to say that um, Old Testament is not Unitarian in some strict sense, unless you presuppose it, and then you have all these problems. This is, by the way, guys, you realize this is why. Ever since Augustine's struggles in book two or three of On the Trinity with how there are theophanies, I mean, the Latin church has gone in the wrong direction. And they argue like Muslims. So how does people not see this? Just, just people just don't know, like Old Testament theology, I guess, is that what's going on here? Um, let's see. I talked about contradictions in the narratives between the Quran and the Bible. Uh, so I don't think there's anything else in that in that talk. Um, Father Deacon, is there anything you wanted to comment on from the Garaby paper? I mentioned it earlier and I think I linked it. You and I did a whole stream on it right here, which I'll link again for people who want a deep dive on uh, the Garaby paper. And Father Deacon and I joined me for that th uh, two or three years ago. So you can go deeper into that talk there. Um, are you still there? Is there anything you want to comment on in regard to uh, Trinity in the Old Testament? Uh, no, I also covered, uh, there's some really good material that I've covered in the Catechesis Continuing Education, uh, I almost said Continuing Education Camp, the Continuing Education class uh, from Father Pomazansky's uh, book, Orthodox Theology, that I recommend, where he just goes over all the Old Testament passages that make reference to the Trinity, so I encourage people to check that out. Yeah, so uh, he has, as he said, um, catechesis lectures that are over on his channel, uh, Patristic Faith, where you can find him discussing a lot of these Old Testament texts and passages. <clears throat> um, I guess we, I mean, I don't know what other, let's see if I've made all the main points I wanted to make here. I mean, we can go into, I think that to do a full discourse on uh, Old Testament Trinity texts, it needs to be its own talk. Um, I'll go ahead and put up the old talk that I did because it's still it's still decent. But uh, let me th I always forget what I titled it. But I will is the 
four or five year ago talk on this where it's a three hour talk where we go through we go through a lot of Old Testament texts, not all the ones that I'd like to update it with. Um, so you can watch that there. And uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to Q&A questions. So I see some people already kind of in the quay. Uh, if you want to speak, if you want to uh, uh, introduce an argument, if you want to bring forth a question, a challenge, uh, feel free to here with, uh, by requesting to speak. I'll give you the microphone. Remember to unmute. Uh, Twitter Spaces automatically mutes you. You got to hit the unmute and just start talking, and uh, I'll let you know that I hear you. And I've got, I've got uh, Bible Gateway pulled up. We can go to the the text here in the Old Testament if you want to. I've got Nostra Aetate pulled up right here. We can go to those texts if you want to. So if you got questions, challenges, uh, now's the time. Just hit request to speak. Thank you for the super chats too. We'll read the super chats here in a minute. First up is. Missed cheese. What's up, missed cheese? Oh, hello, Jay. Yes, sir. You know, uh, also in Genesis, it said, let us make us in our image, not just my image, you know. That's an immediate, like, uh, tip off that there's more, more to this than what we see. I think ultimately it is a Trinitarian passage. The problem is that a lot of times it's just hand waved and people just say, Oh, well that's just talking about the angels. And so even though I do think it is triadic, it's it, it, when we understand all the rest of the passages, it makes sense. I just think that it's also, yeah, go ahead. also, uh, I feel like a lot of people say like the Trinitarian is the pagan because they unironically have the sky fairy sky daddy belief where they think God's just like a guy, you know? Yeah. I think, like, yeah. in any anthropomorphic excess, uh, and somebody, the Muslims say, oh, you're anthropomorphic. Oh, you mean like a bunch of how Islam is anthropomorphic? Like we just saw with Jake. Like God, like God is literally just a banker, a bureaucrat. Or he has a foot and a sh two right, two right hands, a foot and a shin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, well, then again, we say the devil has no knees because he never bows to anyone. But that's more fanciful writing than anything. But the way I see it is like, is consciousness, you know, ego, super ego, and ego, they're all unique, separate parts of yourself, but they're still, you know, their own self. Uh, you're not tied to my subconscious, you're tied to my conscious, but the subconscious is this within me. Or like, uh, like social media is a good metaphor. Uh, you have your account, Jay Dwyer, you have the persona you portray through it, and you have the person yourself. Like, I see you as your account. Uh, that that is who I see you as. Uh, you present yourself in a way that may not be who I see, but the you who is you can only be seen truly by you, and we only have small glasses of it. And like, I mean, Jesus is called the Word, you know, and as God, and we're just God's, um, you know, just tale, a story. So anything we have is just an abstraction of His, you know, His Word, His breath is alive, it's living and part of Him, like. When I'm tell you when I'm speaking to you right now, you're all you're getting is my word and my breath, like the Holy Spirit in Christ. But you'll never know me. Unless yeah, you know. that that overlaps uh, somewhat with some of the patristic analogies. You know, you do have the early apologists, and uh, even up into the Cappadocian period, you have people saying we can make an analogy to the Father is like the mind. Uh, the logos is like the word proceeding from the mind that expresses the mind. So it becomes a kind of a, uh, an expression, an image, an icon. Um, Jesus is the express uh, icon of the Father, etc. Uh, so yeah, I think that there's some, some value in those kind of analogies and the church fathers use that. Go ahead. Also, um, I wanted to add to, I'm not sure exactly what the response is, but if we look at the um, the the... The Hebrew text in Genesis, uh, the word Elohim in the, the Genesis text uh, has a grammatical form of plural and number. Yeah. Now, uh, what response have you seen from Unitarians and uh, straight I, I think they try to say that that's God and like the divine council, like God and the angels is what they'll try to say. Okay. But, I mean, the problem with that is that when we get into other texts like, uh, say, Ezekiel, right? Ezekiel 1 to 10, and I did a whole lecture on this because it was such a powerful uh, 
presentation. If you go to Ezekiel 1 to 10, I mean, we got explicit statements where the the glory uh, the glory of the Father is identified as this Son of Man who rides the chariot. He, so he's personified. Uh, and we have the Spirit. In other words, the, the, the Trinity is absolutely profuse in uh, these chapters. Genesis, I'm sorry, uh, Ezekiel 1 to 10. And so the Son of Man is the face of Yahweh. He's the glory of Yahweh. He's the one like a, a, a son of man who is the image of the father so all of that is in ezekiel 1 to 10 and so it's just one of the stronger i mean there's many but it's one of the stronger examples in the old testament where we can't just relegate this form this manifestation or what he's sometimes called in the septuagint he's called the voice the voice the word the voice uh who appears to uh, elijah and so forth we can't relegate him to pure angel status because he's identified as the glory. God's glory is not given to another. Remember that in Isaiah, right? But wait, wait, well, wait a minute. Now there's a form of God's glory in Ezekiel 1 to 10, who is the face of Yahweh, who has the name of Yahweh in him, as it says in uh, Exodus, I think, 23. So you see how it, you have to read all of these passages together and all these passages together clearly give us that God is not a strict unity. There's a sense in which he's unity, yes. But there's also a sense in which he has son and spirit. Uh, let's see, next up is... Uh, Jizz Pear? Okay. Sounds kind of gross, but whatever. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah, God bless you, man. And God bless Father and Anais. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, I don't see anyone using this passage, but it's an interesting passage for sure. Can you go to Second Samuel uh, chapter 24, verse 16? And can you read it? If you can. I'm here. Yeah, can you read it, please? Uh, what verse? Second Samuel, I'm chapter not. 24. Yeah. So this is when they build a uh, uh, an altar for uh, at the threshing floor? Yeah. Yeah. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy it, the Lord relented from the destruction and said, who was a destroy, a destroy the people, is enough, restrain your hand. The angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of uh, Arana, the Jebusite. Yeah, so if we read through the Torah and Judges and those books, we establish that the angel of the Lord is a theosony mm -hmm. of God and that he's God himself. So I just wanted to ask, who told the angel to stop? Well, I'm sure they would say it's it's God the Father, right? Yeah, no, I just wanted to point out an interesting verse because it's the father explicitly talking to the son. Correct. And I don't see this verse being used as much as it should. So yeah, I just wanted to say that. Well, I mean, I, I, I've commented on it. We commented it on it fairly recently, I think, in one of the live streams. But um, yeah, I mean, I think they're just going to say that, well, that's just a created angel. So I agree with you that you know, typically angel of the Lord does signify the sun, but the problem, the problem is that in this passage, there's not anything that immediately tells us that here angel of the Lord is the second person. Yeah, I think it is, but they're just going to say, well, that doesn't say that it's the, you know, second person that could be a created. Angel. That's just Michael or Gabriel or something. Yeah. It's the typical, it's the typical cope that they use but yeah i just wanted to say that man. yeah that is a good passage i appreciate that uh yeah but i wanted to remind everybody of what what we see in ezekiel i guess so i mentioned this a minute ago but you'll notice what we see in ezekiel is that when he sees the chariot <clears throat> he sees that within the chariot there's one that has a likeness of a man and as it goes down we see that uh there's flashes and so forth. And then if you read Ezekiel 1 all the way to chapter 10, 
you, you notice the the way that the appearance of the man here is described it is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God and the description of the appearance here is identical to the way that John in the Apocalypse describes Jesus when he appears so that lets us know that it's the same figure Jesus appearing to Ezekiel that appears to John and between Ezekiel 1 and then 8 and then 10 you get a lot of the same descriptions okay so and I, do you understand people that want to say this is a creature it's the image of glory okay God's glory is not a creature and everybody admits that this is the image of the glory the face of God the form of God the voice of God I mean, there's, there's, you guys understand there's tons of these passages. And so this, this, this dispute, this doesn't just destroy, by the way, the natural theology of Nostratate and Rome and Trent. It also undercuts the, the Muslim arguments and the Aryan arguments. All right, let's move on to the next. Jared. You gotta unmute, man. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Jay, just want to say thank you for all your work. Um, I'm a for all you've done. Many years. You opened my eyes in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I guess the one question that I had is, like, you once mentioned that Plan A for God was the incarnation. Why was that Plan A? Like, why was that always from the from the onset His plan to be an incarnate, I guess, human being? Well, I, I mean, we don't have an exact answer as to why God created or did these things other than I think, you know, St. Maximus says something like out of the goodness of God. So presumably for the same reason, um, the second person always wanted to become incarnate. I don't know. I don't know if we know the ultimate, you know, ultimate reasons why God wanted to do that. But the, the answer is something like just out of the goodness of his own, his own overflowing goodness, boundless goodness, something like that is what Maximus says. I, I, okay, I, I see what you're saying, but like coming from, I guess, the Roman Catholic, like penal substitution kind of notion of salvation. Well, hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Penal substitution is specifically a Reformation doctrine. It's not the Roman Catholic doctrine. The Roman Catholic doctrine of atonement is satisfaction, not satisfaction, penal substitution. Okay. So I guess my, what's like the orthodox understanding of, of, the purpose of the incarnation for redemption. Well, the purpose of the incarnation was always to deify man. Always. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a plan B when man fell. Because if you look at what Paul says, Paul says we are made in the image of Christ. And this is another thing that refutes natural theology. Man being made in the image of God is in is Christocentric. And if you get the book uh, Deification uh, uh Paniotis Nellis's book, Deification, the whole first chapter is answering what you're asking. It's all about how man was originally created as a model of Christ, as a model of the Logos. He, it's a Christocentric creation from the beginning. That's the very basis for uh, Paul to say that Christ is a type, that, that Adam is a type of Christ because he's made after Christ. He's made the image of Christ. And for Roman Catholics, they just can't fathom this. Very bizarre. Although, to be right. fair, Franciscans do believe this. The Franciscans are the only Roman, maybe Scotus, uh, are the only Roman Catholics that believe the Orthodox position on this. I, I, I hear you. Um, and then, like, one of the questions, too, is kind of how you talked about Jacob wrestling with Christ, like, obviously wrestling with God. But right. how does that work if, if Christ hasn't incarnated yet? Like, what, who is, like, he physically wrestling with? Well, it's the same principle of all the theophanies. By the way, here's this book, Paniotis Nellis, Deification in Christ. The whole first chapter is about how uh, we are made in the image of, of Christ. So I would recommend that to people who are wondering about the question. Um, well, there is a mystery involved in uh, theophanies. We don't know the exact mode in which he's able to be in time and space. 
and to wrestle in this way, but yet that's what we have in the text. And so this is partly why the Orthodox Church talks about the essence energy distinction. It's partly there to explain the theophanies in the Old Testament. And Roman Catholics have a hard time with this because they think, well, if there's physicality or solidity involved in some way, it must, as St. Gregory Paloma says, we don't know the means that this occurs, but we know that it does occur. And to your point, like that's kind of the problem that I noticed with Rome is how they try to put everything in all these little boxes Correct. to the point where they just, it doesn't make any more sense. Well, and, and here's the thing. If you follow with the logic of Roman Catholics when they argue against the Ophanes in the Old Testament, they are unwittingly undercutting the incarnation itself. So, because if God is an absolutely simple essence, let me give an example. So, in Phaser's five proof books, in the Neoplatonic proof chapter, he says that we can use the Neoplatonic arguments to prove, quote, God, the classical theist version of, quote, God. Uh, and he says, because they argue uh, forcefully that the absolutely simple monad cannot be in time and space. Okay, do you understand that that makes the incarnation no longer possible? It's impossible. Yeah, it makes it impossible. And like just touching on on that and kind of the Old Testament and Notre Dame, because that was one thing that caught my attention from the get go. I was like, wait a second, I have to morally assent to the idea that I worship the same God as as uh, Jews and Muslims. Does it make it so? I spoke with one of my uh, Catholic priests about it, and I explained kind of what you're explaining how Abraham worshipped the Trinity, and kind of like how Christ Himself says, Abraham saw me and like, saw my day, and he, yeah. he rejoiced and was glad. Yeah. And he was like, no, no, no. To think that Abraham knew of the Trinity as we know it now, uh, obviously he didn't have the, the, like you said, the Nicene d definition of it, but he completely disagreed with the notion that Abraham worshipped Christ um, in okay. the Old Testament. Well, then he's disagreeing um, with what Jesus, I mean, he's disagreeing with Jesus because Jesus says, Abraham rejoiced to see my day and his son was glad. Exactly. But that's like, that's the Roman Catholic position. It's, exactly. just, it's just false. Well, that's and, uh, why the Roman Catholic and, position is a false god. It's a Unitarian natural theology deity, the same thing that the Muslims argue. By the way, um, so, hold on. Uh, to be clearer, too, to be very precise, I believe Bishop Irenae argues that it's also possible that the body of Christ that you see uh, wrestling with Jacob is actually the deified flesh of the incarnate Christ outside of time and space. So because he's deified and outside of time and space, he can then step yeah. into, you know, wrestling with Jacob, even though he's not incarnate yet. I, I think that Bishop Irenae makes that argument, which I think is a plausible, plausible as well. But even yeah, if, even if we, even, right. even if we say that, by the way, uh, I mean, there's yeah. the same problem still is there quote problem. Uh, with any other theophany like the Shekinah, right? I mean, here we have the glory cloud coming down, or the 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 pillar of fire in the desert. In the desert, I mean, these the same questions can be raised about that as well. So even if we wanted to be really picky and say, well, how is a theophany God in time and space coming and going? Well, this exact question is raised in in the triads, and Saint Gregory Palamas just says God is not bound by time and space. He can do these things. We don't know how. And we don't have to inquire into the scholastic definitions of how it's possible and then, say, then saying, well, God can't do it. Uh, I mean, it's just it's not the answer that he gives. And that's why, to be really clear here, like what Palama says is completely consistent with what we're seeing in the Old Testament. Yeah. And it's funny because every time I, I kind of bring up some of these questions, I they would say, oh, just pray a rosary. Just just pray a rosary. Yeah, don't even I got that. I got like, that, oh, too. These are kind of... Yeah. These are kind of big. These are these are huge deals. I mean, the whole idea of like created versus uncreated grace in the Thomistic sense and the Palamite sense. But the thing that got me was was how because I went to a Melkite church, and Palamas is is a, is a venerated saint there. So how can you at one point be a, a heretic, and and then now be a saint? But I guess to keep it on the topic of of the Old Testament, um, and like you mentioned before, like the monarchy of the father like how does the monarchy of the father not imply like any sort of superiority like i understand they're all co-equal and co-eternal but when i hear monarchy i just think of like one ruling over the other if that makes sense all right so i recommend that everybody who's interested in this question i'm going to put the link in the the thing here so here's dr branson's um five i think it's a five video lecture series on the monarchy of the father and so no there, there's not can you mute it's really loud in the background man Sorry, about that. Sorry uh, so 
look, the word monarchia, uh, there's nothing about it that necessitates ontological status above another. Okay, so for example, let's think about a, a monarch and his son. Okay, between a king and the prince, do they share the same? Can you mute, man? It's, it keeps getting loud. Just mute. Yeah, thanks. So between a king and a son, there is a primacy of origin. But in terms of nature, does a king have more human nature than the prince? No, of course not. They equally have the same nature because the prince has the same authority, powers, and rule, assuming in the analogy that he's also, you know, taking the throne, we'll say. But he's a, he's distinct. Right. Okay. So there's so there's nothing about there's nothing about the the fact that the father is the sole cause that makes him ontologically superior to the son when the son as we just saw in john 5 jesus says that i have been working all the works the father does i do i've been doing the same works as the father since yeah. the creation of the world so as basil says yeah. when he argues this with eunomius he says same works same powers same energies prove same nature and that's also how he argues that the Holy Spirit is just as divine as the Father and the Son, because the Holy Spirit does the exact same works and operations as the Father and the Son. Therefore, he has the same nature. But everybody, everybody in the Orthodox world, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Everybody in the Orthodox world uh, who is interested in this question in contrast to Islam and in contrast to uh, Roman Catholic natural theology should definitely go watch Dr. Branson's uh, lectures on the monarchy of the Father. Because it's all from Cap. He wrote his, his dissertations on the Cappadocians. And one of the questions that I, I'm struggling to answer with a lot of my like Muslim friends is, well, how could how could an infinite being, you know, how could an infinite God become finite? But did Christ ever become finite by taking human form, or is that just a, a well? This is the passage. Right? So this is the Philippians passage called the kenosis. So he enters into a mode of being that is unique without losing his divinity. So uh, he willfully chose not to exercise all of his powers and operations, which by the way means that God is not reducible to actus purus. Because if God is reducible to pure act, there's no such thing as limiting and choosing not to actualize all of your powers. So the kenosis passage of Philippians is another way to refute this point, but it's answering the very question that, you, that you're asking, which is that he willingly chose to enter into a mode of being as man, uh, which is different from the mode of being which he was prior to that. This is explained in John 1, right, where it says, even though he was amongst us walking around and we touched him and saw him, he was still in the bosom of the Father. So he never surrendered his divine nature, even though he entered into a mode of being that was unique. And in, gotcha. a, and, and gotcha. in, a, sense, in a sense, willfully, quote, limiting. Right. And so when you say in the bosom of the Father, is, does that mean you're, they're united in thought, mind, will, essence, and all those things? That's like, a passage that's, referring to it's referring to the fact that he never ceased being the eternally generated son. Okay. So even, in, okay. even while he's incarnate walking around with us, he is still the eternally generated son of the Father. Got you. Got you. Okay. And that's what, you know, the whole, the whole passage of John 1 is essentially making this point. Right. My, I guess my last question is coming from the Roman Catholic, like the cut, sort of appeasement uh, doctrine of salvation, and, and like what I used to do at the at mass with the with the holy sacrifice. What is sort of the orthodox? Because I, I can't really do this when I read online. Like what's sort of the orthodox per, or I guess um, view of salvation and atonement from? Uh, you could get the Pomazansky book. There's a the, there's actually a good chapter in the Pomazansky book answering this very question, contrasting it to both the Protestant doctrine and the Roman Catholic satisfaction doctrine. Uh, yes. Father Deacon, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's um, a great actual section because he has a lot of great footnotes to um, explaining. Uh, one of the things that becomes confusing is that the same term might be used by different faiths, and but it doesn't mean the same thing. So people can get really confused by this. And so Father Pomazansky has a lot of footnotes 
explaining this, that although the word uh, atonement may be used or even penalties, it's not the same as what's meant in Calvinism or the Roman view. Um, and in, fi- in fact, uh, cites um, even some of the canons and councils on this. So it's really, really good. To check that out. I would also yeah. recommend yeah. for a little deeper discussion um, beyond what Pomazensky says, which Pomazensky is a great introduction, as Father Deacon said. Uh, there's a really good chapter in the new uh, Mayendorf Papadakis book where it gets into the uh, Byzantine synods that define in what sense the uh, offering is triadic. And so the offering of the humanity of the Son is an offering that the Son does to the entire triad. There's actually a Byzantine synod that, that, that has a controversy that inadvertently refutes the Protestant doctrine of uh, penal substitution, if you understand the teaching of this, uh, of this doctrine, or excuse me, of this... Uh, uh, it's the two local councils that's held in Constantinople, 1156 through 57. Got you. All right. Yeah, I'll definitely have to check that out because the whole notion of penal substitution, it just kind of, if you really think about it, it kind of just leads to atheism in a lot of ways because it, does, yeah. it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, and the whole idea of like cosmic child abuse, it just, yeah. um, so that, that's, that's kind of what I grew up with. If you have the Papadakis Meindorf book, it discusses it starting on page 189, and it's the controversy over the deacon Soterikos. Soterikos is a proto Protestant penal substitutionist. And the decision of the Byzantine synods end up reaffirming what's clearly the orthodox view of the fact that the divine person of the Son deifies the flesh. It's an offering of love, not a penal substitution damnation situation. By the way, I just realized something in my last uh, class that I was teaching on the Catechesis Continuing Education. We were talking about the Roman view of uh, indulgences and merits. And so keep in mind that Protestants are responding to that. And as I brought up before, I, you know, I, I argued this in my PhD thesis as well, that oftentimes when somebody responds or critiques another system, they may reject something in that, but they're embracing the whole conceptual paradigm that's the problem itself. So one of the things that we see is uh, the Roman Catholics have this kind of merit, like the uh, salvation, that you can store up merits. I made a joke that it's like there's a standing reserve of heavenly Bitcoin, uh, yeah. which can be sold and uh, or even given uh, by the Pope, but they have this really weird kind of mathematical yeah. um, idea that, and this is where yeah, God's a bean counter. God's a bean the, counter, keeping up with all of these things. That yeah, there must be this cosmic um, reconciliation that uh, imbalance so the idea of like justice for them is uh merits and numbers mm-hmm. and so Absolutely. then what you get is you get the reformers responding to that saying well no you can't be you know saved by any merits that you do but guess what they they embrace they embrace the exact conceptual paradigm yeah it's just jesus pays the merits in many ways so then they develop a penal substitutionary atonement based on a merit-based theology Yeah, so the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, An indulgence is obtained through the Church, who, by virtue of the power binding and loosing, granting to her, granted her by Christ, intervenes in... This is... Dude, who can read this? I mean, most of the Roman Catholics left are boomers. There's no way they could read this tiny text. Uh, Treasury of merits of the saints in Christ obtained from the Father the mercies of the remission of the temporal punishments for their sin. The Church does not want to simply come to the aid of Christians, but also to... spur them to works of devotion, penance, and charity. So so that you can, you, basically there's an infinite Bitcoin spiritual storage that uh, the church, the Pope can tap into. And this is, by the way, where he doles out the, uh, when you see like you get a full plenary indulgence if you pray on your knees going up the steps of the Via Dolorosa. This is because the Pope can tap into this. And this is one of the things, by the way, that, that Luther really called into question, I think, in a, adequately. He was correct about calling this into question. 
Yeah, you made a great point the other day about how, like, well, what if one of those indulgences is going to a WAA game or something like that? And it was like, you're, you're, you're so true because it's a worship of authority and it's so legalistic to where it creates this <laughs> very dry and brittle faith. Um, so when I kind of discovered the orthodox view of, like, sin is a disease and then you have the medicine, it kind of just changed the game for me. Um, I guess one of the things, too, is, like, now that I'm kind of new to orthodoxy and, you know, I, I'm in a real core church now. Um, but how do you, I guess, keep track of, like, who's in communion with who? Um, because I've also heard things about, like, the genuine Orthodox Church or, like, true. Like, I don't know. I just, I want to get a valid, you know, Eucharist. And how do you know who's valid and, I guess, who's not, if that makes sense? Well, typically, the only people, like, obsessing over validity are the people who, in those very tiny, <laughs> <laughs> they're sort of like the Orthodox version of the set of a contest, right? Which are, I mean, they're even more minuscule, tiny, tiny online groups, far smaller than the Roman Catholic set of a contest. Like the idea of sort of obsessing over the validity in this sort of technical canonical, that's a Roman Catholic attitude. So the, the, the fringe uh, Orthodox are exactly the same as the set of a contest in terms of obsessing over validity. You don't really see this obsession in the Orthodox world over quote validity. So it's all a Latin mindset. And I mean, I would just simply appeal to her and everything being, uh, you know, everything sussed out according to like strict validity. I mean, this is that the whole mindset of the Latin tradition uh, post scholasticism is obsessed with this. Uh, it's almost like religion as a technology and God, I can get God to do what I want in the mass or whatever when I follow this formula like a magic ritual, and then God has to do what I want. And even if I'm uh, ordained as a Roman Catholic priest, and that day I become a Satanist, God still has to, uh, you know, be present in my consecrations of the Eucharist to blaspheme it. That's literally their view. So, that, but that whole mindset's wrong. Is what I'm trying to say. So, I would say it's gonna it's yeah. gonna take time to lose the um, legalistic sort of Latin mindset. I know because I was in the same boat as you. Um, but I think when you look at, I mean, David has some good critiques of the, uh, the true Orthodox theories of blackout. So basically their view is it's actually an impossible view because anytime there's a mistake, everybody that's uh, not, it's not just that that guy loses all grace. It's very donatistic in the sense that literally everybody around them also loses grace. Well, if that's the case, then we've all lost grace. I mean, it's a really an impossible, uh, sort of purist type of donatist position. So um, look up David's videos on uh, the, the quote, true Orthodox. Those are really good. For sure. I will. Um, yeah, that was pretty much all the questions I had. Thank you all for your time. And again, thank you, Jay, for your work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, I'm going to have to bow out. Um, is okay. there any, anybody have any questions before I leave? Well, uh, it depends on who I bring up. So I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay. On the next person I'll bring up, um, we'll see if there's any questions for FDA. Solo, what's up? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, so I'm Protestant, and I wanted to know like the most common refutation against Protestantism. Well, I would say two strong refutations, uh, the two strongest that come to my mind would be that the church is necessary to know and to understand what the canon of scripture is. So that would refute sola scriptura. And the second argument would be that most of the classic Protestant models of how we're saved imply either that Jesus is a Nestorian human person who undergoes punishment or that the second person, the Godhead, undergoes the punishment for us and that would be anti-trinitarian so those are the two strongest i can think of yeah and i'd add to the again most of the the protestant errors and heresies are based on kind of more fundamental philosophical and theological errors and heresies uh, for example uh occasionalism um uh what's the other uh nominalism um, these various things that they're kind of premised on that lead them to kind of make the mistakes that that they do. Uh, okay. I won't say I'm convinced because I think Redeem Zoomer has already talked about that and he's like the strongest Protestant 
debater, so. Well, did you see our debate? Yeah, yeah he, he destroyed you. <laughs> <laughs> really? By the way, you yeah. might like, I'm coming up, I'm brewing a new beer. It's called the Dunning-Kruger beer. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a great name for a beer, but um, it sounds to me like you've already been drinking some, so. Yeah, what what uh, what are a couple places where he destroyed me? Uh, he's he's overall like has a stronger theological. What, what's no no what where specifically overall. in our debate did he destroy me? He's he's a better Christian. Where specific? Like, okay, now he's a better quote Christian. So you don't have an actual argument because yeah, he because you, he, he, he's cause he's you more didn't. Pious than you. Right, he's more pious than you. Yeah, well you're drunk, so get out of here. That's all they have. He's more pious than you. Yeah, yeah. Really. coming from. Like classic case of a prelist, right? That um, we're gonna use a Protestant to determine who's more pious or not. Stan, what's up? What up, man? I heard you talking about the angel of the Lord earlier. Yeah, that's Jesus. Yeah, everybody who thinks not, they can get out of here. <laughs> well, yeah, I agree. Yeah, uh, that's show them Isaiah nine six. Yeah, the Wonderful. angel of angel of counsel. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, Judges thirteen or eighteen. Correct. Well, well, Isaiah right. also refers to him as the uh, wonderful, Eternal right? Father. Thank you. Yeah, good quotes. Young logo, what's up, man? What's up, Jay? What's on your mind, man? Um, just uh, been dealing with a lot of uh, Jehovah Witnesses, and I'm sure that you've probably talked about this in previous episodes. So, um, sorry if I waste your time, but um, if you were using like the uh, like the historical analysis of like the Old Testament, you mentioned how there's like some Jewish scholars who mentioned the um you know, the theophanies, how would you, one, cover that um, to like a Jehovah Witness where, they're, where they may use the Old Testament as examples of strict monotheism? Um, and then in the New Testament, um, I think you mentioned this a little bit in regards to the monarchy of the Father, um, and passages in the New Testament where it specifically kind of shows a, in quotes, hierarchy between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, I mean, the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, you know, comes from the totality of the Bible. So there's not any, unfortunately, like one specific area which is like going to nail all of these points because you kind of have to work through a few different points. But if you go watch my video that I have right here, it's called, Is Jesus God and Is God a Trinity? Response to Critics. And that still functions as a, a good uh, response to because I actually made this video in response to a guy who was basically a Jehovah's Witness. So um, I would say check out that video and note all the different texts because there's not going to be one text. But by the way, in, resp in, in response to the previous guy, um, I know that Jesus is called uh, the angel of the Lord, the wonderful, his name is wonderful in Judges. But the point I was making about Isaiah, and this is a point that Sam Shamoon showed me, is that when it calls the child wonderful counselor here in Isaiah 9-6, his name as wonderful is a reference to judges. That's why I mentioned wonderful there. So that lets us know that the one who's named wonderful in Isaiah 9, 6 is the same wonderful in Judges 13. That's the point I brought, uh, the, I was making there. So I would stress to the Jehovah's Witness type people that, um, you know, all of these theophanies consistently make this point that the angel is worshipped. Okay, so we're not supposed to worship creatures. So the message, an, an angel just means messenger. Okay, it can be a created messenger or an uncreated messenger, in our view. And our view makes sense of all the texts. Their view has to say that, uh, well, sometimes the uh, angel is worshipped. So I guess you can, in some case, cases, worship creatures. But actually, if you think about it, Jehovah's Witness theology, if they worship the created son, then they are idolaters. So, and maybe they won't say that. Maybe they'll say, oh, we don't worship... Uh, Jesus, he's just our example. But Arians actually did worship the Son, and they thought he was the first thing that God the Father created. 
And as the Orthodox argued, then you are now an idolater because you're worshiping a creature. So the key point here is that we all should agree we can't worship creatures. So then we have this problem then, well, then what about these theophanies that are worshipped? And they're clearly worshipped multiple times. They're called, uh, if you read the Gideon text, it says, the angel of the Lord turned, Yahweh turned his face to Gideon. Oh, interesting. Neologian. Hello. Hey. Hey, Jay. Uh, how's it going? Uh, I hey. called in about a year ago, and I had some comments that I uh, happened to re-listen to today because I wanted to rem uh, recall that conversation, and I just wanted to uh, refresh your memory because we were talking. And since you're talking about natural theology today, I wanted to bring it up again. I was uh, talking to you about uh, Sherard's essay, Christianity and the Metaphysics of Logic, and um, and also Sogby's We Are All Schismatics, and I just wanted to bring that up again because I think it would be really awesome if you uh, made your way through those, especially Sherard's Well, I did get, I think you also mentioned 900 Years Together, and I bought that, but I couldn't get the Zogby text because it's always uh, uh, out of print and sold out. Okay, I have it in a PDF. I can send it to you. Uh, I can maybe DM you over. You can. You over can. It's just I hate PDFs. I just. Yeah, I get I mean, it. I can go have it printed out if I have to, but. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, anyway, if you have lineaments, it'd be awesome to hear your take on Christianity and the metaphys metaphysics of logic. I feel like it's a really powerful tool against natural theology and all the rest of that stuff. Let me write so it down. Whenever you get around to that, it'd be much appreciated. Yeah, yeah I, and I, didn't I also mean, wanted to ask. Yeah, sorry. No, I'm just saying I'm writing it down because I won't remember. But uh, yeah, I, I I haven't read that short essay in probably ten years. But I'm familiar with it. I remember what he's arguing. Uh, I'll have to go back and redo it. Cool, sounds good. Hey, and then I wanted to ask quickly if you could give uh, briefly like a summary of of what Blackerney taught because we I hear a lot about Blackerney. Uh, from you and others, and I have the I have the book that uh, Crisis in Byzantium, but I haven't gotten around to it yet. But I'd love if you could just give a quick summary of what Blackerney actually taught about the Holy Spirit. Um, well, we have lectured on that, so uh, fuller talks can be found in our discussions of um, eternal manifestation. I just had Dr. Branson on where we covered Filioque and Blackerney. Uh, so you go go watch the. Uh, Monarchy of the Father, Filioque discussion with Dr. Branson maybe three or four months ago. Um, another way to see the summation of these of this of this what's is the the Tomos against John Beckos. Um, those that's another good kind of summary. Are you familiar with that? No, I'm not. I think you can find uh, the Tomos against Beckos online. Let's see. I think this is it. So these are some of the examples of, yeah, so this is from Crisis in Byzantium. I think it's one of the chapters in it. But if you're looking for a summary of what's taught, uh, read this right here. Exposition of the Tomos of Faith against John Beckus. Because Beckus was the Byzantine Latinizer. Um, and by the way, this would, by extent, uh, extension, condemn all the ecumenists. It would condemn all the people who are pretending that we teach the same thing as the Roman Catholics. The Tomos against John Beckos is is uh, is denying all that. So it's basically just stating that the Filioque doctrine is, uh, in the Roman Catholic sense, uh, according to Lyons, of a double eternal hypostatic procession is false. And the only sense in which there's a relationship between the Son and the Spirit is the manifestation and movement of the Spirit through the Son. And so that's what through means. So that's the Tomos against John Beckos. If, if you wanted, like, the summary of what, what's going on in these medieval uh, Palamite synods. And so that's why this article cites the Byzantine, the Papadakis book. Okay, so as far as I understand, both uh, from and through the Father are anathematized in the sense of procession, uh, hypostatic procession, but there is a yep. certain, there's an energetic through the sun correct right. and that's the teaching of gregory cypress correct awesome all right well thank you so much jay yeah great question uh yeah and thank you for reminding me of those uh those points you made a year ago uh leonid what's up leonid
You there? You got Hello. Home? Hey. Hello. What's up? Yes. Um, I have a question regarding the. Uh, excuse me for my English. It's not my native language. It's okay. I have a question regarding the scroll of uh, Esther, the book of Esther. Mm. Yes. Um, I don't know a lot about the textual scholarship around Esther. I do know that the Orthodox Study Bible, for example, has the longer uh, chapters of Esther. So it has like Esther M, Esther B, Esther C. So, But I don't know much about the textual scholarship around Esther. Uh, yes, so my question is like, is the, the church see it like uh, an historical book or like uh, an um, uh, allegorical story? You know, like what is the position of the church regarding this? Uh, I'm not aware of a, any specific statement on the status of the text. I, I, my feeling is that it, it's presented as a historical text. Um, so I would tend to think that it's a historical text. There might be, you know, allegorical uh, meanings and symbolisms found within it, for sure. Like typological symbols? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, I get it. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great question. I actually, actually am not... Uh, I mean, I've read Esther, you know, many times, but I don't actually know a lot of this sort of scholarship around Esther, I have to admit. Um, M.K. Grafenagel, what's up? Hey, hope you're doing well. Yes, sir. What's up? Uh, I just have two questions. It's actually just a two-parter, and you touched on it briefly. Um, I watched Dr. Branson, you talk about the Trinity and the relationship and the monarchia. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to get a clarification on this so I could tie it to my second part of my question. Um, Dr. Branson uh, said that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, essentially uh, the Son and the Holy Spirit are the left and right arm of the Father. That's how the monarchy makes sense. That's what I heard him say. So I want to know if you confirm that uh, definition. Or I think uh, if I remember, and I've got the... the the video pulled up. So for those that are interested uh, and this regard, this re uh, relates to the previous guy's question about black or nay. Um, if you want to watch that discussion, here it is. I'm gonna link it for you guys. If I remember Dr. Branson said that this is a, a in one of the Cappadocians. Mm -hmm. cause, Cause he was responding to the filioque in the sense that if, if the, that triangle is inverted, if it's flipped over, then it makes the son and the father kind of like, yeah, it, then it becomes, you know, uh, multiple gods and you got a problem. They become buddies. Yeah. Um, those are his words. Um, so I wanted to know, is that a fair uh, way to look at it, to see the Son and Holy Spirit as the left and right arm? So I think all the analogies will be limited because, for example, if we only had that analogy, we might miss the close connection uh, that the Spirit and the Son do have. And so, so this is <clears throat> raised at uh, uh, Blackerne in Florence, which deals with whether or not the spirit rests in and manifests through the sun. So in one sense, in terms of hypostatic origin, I think it would be correct to, to, to use the two arms analogy. But in terms of uh, manifestation, it doesn't work because the spirit has to uh, move and manifest through the sun. So both are true, and they're, but they're limiting. I see what you mean. I guess it's uh, the 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 two hands and the two hands uh, analogy works as in one essence, so it's, they're all attached. But yeah, well, it, it uh, works. It works yeah. in terms of hypostatic origin, but it doesn't work in yeah. terms of manifestation. I see. Because um, because my the the reason why that was sound in my mind and that made sense that an analogy is because uh, given that the father is the fountain fountainhead and he's the source mm -hmm. um, he's the autotheos mm -hmm. it makes more sense for me to digest it that way and I guess this I guess I'll say my second part of the question so you know where I'm coming from um, in the liturgical prayers um, the priest continuously emphasizes you know Christ our God Christ our God glory to you Christ our God um, and yes sure there's 
uh, the Holy Spirit and the Father are mentioned, and there's a prayer for the Father, but it seems like Christ is highlighted above all. And I want to know, since the Orthodox position emphasizes the monarchia and isn't the Catholic filioque, I wanted to know why isn't the Father emphasized instead of the, instead of the Son? Because that's what I seem to see every Sunday. I mean, I don't know about totaling up, like, emphasis. I mean, uh, you know, when I go to church, it's, to me, the emphasis seems triadic. So, I mean, but maybe there is some sort of numerical reference to the Son more than the Father and the Spirit. I, I don't know. I, I've always, I just I haven't. That giving more focus or supremacy to the Father in the sense, and I don't mean this, and the subordination hierarchical standpoint, even though there's an element of that mm -hmm. with the monarchia, mm -hmm. I mean in terms of the origin factor of him being the source. And I think even Branson explained it in that way that uh, kind of like the Big Bang, even though he happens, uh, the father happens, like existed throughout all times, uh, the the Logos and the Holy Spirit happen immediately after, like they, they exist immediately after. If that makes sense, I don't know if I'm butchering his explanation of it. Yeah, I don't know what to say. I see. Okay, any uh, any recommendations to get a better clarification on that, or am I just looking at it wrong? Well, I Dr. Branson always answers emails, so like um, I, I'm sure he would be happy to answer your email if you go to his website. You can his his uh, academic emails right there, so he would definitely be better for that kind of a question. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, man. Uh, sorry, I wasn't uh, better no, to answer that, but but yeah, Doctor Branson definitely is, uh, knows more than I do on those topics. K H F F, what's up? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I was just curious. Uh, I know that um, you usually, your, your point of study is uh, theology and metaphysics. Um, but I was wondering, had you seen anything on uh, Jay Smith and um, kind of the work that he's done recently? Uh, a lot of people have mentioned him to me, and I just haven't got around to it. It's not at all that I'm trying to ignore it. But I, I hear that his uh, critiques of Islam are pretty devastating. Yeah, they are very devastating. Um, it's definitely a different point of argument uh, than yours, but um, very does he, devastating. No, no, does, he, <clears throat> does he have a channel? Where, where do we find him? Yeah, so that's Thander Films. It's PF. Um, don't know the right. P F A N D E R Films. And uh, he does uh, interviews with a lot of academics that are doing studies like on the ground. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, he goes that route, but it basically his argumentation is that the Sassanid empire, uh, created Islam as a way to combat the Roman empire because mm. all of their, all of their peoples were Christian and they couldn't fight each other. So they had to convert them to this new religion that was better than Christianity. And therefore, uh, you see those um, additions like, you know, spoils of war and just incentives to, to go to war, basically. Interesting. Um, so that's his, his arguments. You know, I, I, I've, I don't know a whole lot about that specific historical period, but I've wondered in my mind if, if at times Islam wasn't just appropriated by certain monarchs, sultans, the you know, Ottomans and so forth, because... It does seem to fit very well with a kind of um, geopolitical type of agenda. And I think that today's intelligence agencies uh, as well uh, know enough to know that, you know, Islam can be crafted and, and molded very well into um, kind of geopolitical skele skeleton key type of operations. Yeah, his, his main um, points of attack are uh, the coinage that were used in the time of um, Muhammad. Um, and directly after Muhammad, all still bear uh, Christian symbols like priests and crosses and things like that. Um, and then 
apparently there's like 32,000 different versions of the Quran instead of just the one that Muslims always reference. Well, we had the burning um, of them to try to get one version of it, right? So right. now yeah. uh, that's interesting because in the Oxford Handbook of Islam, I noticed reading through a bunch of the uh, entries in that for the for the Jake debate, there was a really good chapter early on uh, about how it, it is the scholars now do uh, affirm that it's Arian and Nestorian versions of Christianity that influenced early Islam. And that's interesting because John Damascus says that in his Heresiology, who was one of the first, you know, he was writing, I think, for one of the sultans. He was a scholar for one of the sultans as an Orthodox Christian. And so I think at times people took issue with this and said, oh, it's not influenced because because if it's influenced by uh, uh, like Christian pseudepigrapha and Talmudic tradition and, you know, uh, heterodox Christianity like Arians and Nestorians, then that means it's not a new revelation to Muhammad. <laughs> so and if you read the uh, Gabriel Said Reynolds book, which is one of the texts that I read for the Daniel debate. Um, you know, Reynolds has a list. Well, th that whole book is really uh, about discrepancies and contradictions in the biblical narratives versus the way the Quran depicts certain biblical narratives. And that would also suggest, for example, there's influence of this, the seven sleepers of Ephesus. There's the Testament of Abraham. Uh, there's all these pseudepigraphic texts that seem to have made their way into uh, the Quran. So clearly there's these, these sort of oddball, uh, weird uh, influences, including Nestorianism and Arianism, that play into Islam as well, which is basically seems to be vindicated now. Yeah. Um, an another thing that, that he goes over is um, there's like these secret passages in the Quran, I guess, that nobody can interpret or, or something like that. Um, and basically... If you, oh, do you, do you if mean you, like do you mean like the passages where you're you're not you're uh, forbidden to inquire into the meaning those kinds of passages? Well, there's some passages that they they don't even understand what it says. Yeah, that's like, what I'm talking know, about. That, yeah, and they'll say, yeah. "Oh, you can't inquire into this." Yeah. Right. So what they've done is, um, I think it was a German scholar. He took and um, Arabic is just a a newer version of Aramaic. So if you take the Arabic back to Aramaic, which is just taking off some slashes and dots and making it into Aramaic again, mm -hmm. um, it's just about Jesus. Like everything it talks about is about Jesus, and um, it's it's pretty much the gospel just hidden, basically. So if you take those out, put it back into Aramaic, then it makes total sense. Well, you when you say hidden, do you mean corrupted or like, what what do you mean? Because because I mean the Quran is not the sense. Quran is is nonsense, bro. So what do you mean? No, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I just mean hidden in the sense that it's they've overlaid things over it to hide. Yes, that I see what you mean. In fact, yeah, Sam Sam Shamoon had a really good video. He pointed out one of our interviews years ago where he showed that there's a section of the Quran which is like a jumbled up version of several verses from the Gospel of John. It's just all it's jumbled up. That's all I had. I just wanted to know if you had uh, looked into that, and I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I need to. I just keep I keep forgetting to to go deeper into that kind of stuff because uh, I, I focused ended up focusing so heavenly heavenly heavily on um, you know Trinity versus uh, you know Tawhid, um, and I, I haven't gone deep into a lot of these you know historical textual issues with Islam, but. But thank you for that. Yeah, there's plenty of people way better than me at that. Um, just, just for example, the way this works is, people might think, well, how have you, how have you, how do you not know this? But you've done all these debates with Muslims. Well, each Muslim, there's as many product Muslim schools as there are basically sects anywhere else, and they all have a million different views on what they pretend is the clear, simple teaching of God's oneness. Okay, well, there's like a zillion different schools on what Allah's oneness even is. And so hopefully people have begun to see, oh, well, wait a minute. I thought this religion was like, you know, so clearly simple for the simple people and everybody can see that Allah is one. And then you've got all these people fighting over what it means. Uh, you know, the, the Shias, like if you watch the Jake Khalil debate, Khalil is just basically restating a kind of Neoplatonism. Jake is like, no, nah, dude, you know, Allah has a foot. So, I mean, dude, they don't know what it means so 
M MKG, what's up? Not MTG, MKG. Hey, uh, another question here. Um, I actually, it's actually tied to what I previously asked. I wanted to know, uh, regarding questions like these, uh, how much can I trust my, my priest to give me the correct answer or trust his answer when it comes to things like this? Correct answer on what? Like, what is uh, anything? Regarding, regarding the Trinity, what does it mean, or references in the Old Testament, like, whatever... Uh, my priest's explanation is for those things like how much can I take that without salt I mean I don't I don't think I think in every communion you could conceivably have uneducated priests uneducated pastors I mean so this is this is probably a feature of, of every communion I would say that typically on average orthodox priests are probably better defenders of the Trinity than say the average Roman Catholic priest. I mean, a Roman Catholic priest, he might on off offhand know a good bit about the Trinity or something like that. But most of the time, a Roman Catholic priest, a Novus Ordo priest, is just going to be like, well, go read the, the uh, you know, read Augustine on the Trinity or go read the, the Catechism. Yeah. Um, so I think that on issues of Trinity and Incarnation, they're probably better than the average Roman Catholic priest. But... Um, there are a lot of cases where, unfortunately, even Orthodox priests are lacking in some theological uh, training and knowledge. Cool. And uh, also, when you said uh, to contact Bo Branson via email, I was wondering if you would happen to have him on one of your next live streams, uh, Q&As. So maybe it could happen there. Yeah, so uh, we're going to do a, re a debate review of the... Uh, Jake debate. So it'll be me, Lewis, Kai, uh, and Dr. Branson, and uh, that would be a good time to to like raise Q and A and stuff. But okay, cool. uh, that'll probably be in the next few weeks. We're just waiting on Lewis and Kai to have a, a, a time when they're free to do it. But we'll eventually do it. It took us a while to do the the, the Daniel review. Uh, you know how K Kai is very uh, meticulous, so when he does a debate review, he wants like you know, True. he wants like a fifty minute presentation, which I'm totally cool with. His his presentations are great, um, so I'm sure that what he's doing is just kind of working up a big presentation, and then you can ask Dr. Branson, you know, whatever at that time. But he's also really good at emails, so he's he's usually answered every email I've sent. But let's see who's next. Lucos, what's up, Lucos? We got high fructose corn syrup and glucose in the house. <laughs> <laughs> hey what's up jay how you doing i'm good man what's up with you hey so i'm just learning about uh, uh the orthodox view of like what grace is you know divine energy and speaking with calvinists or protestants they use this term and you probably heard of it unmerited favor what as they describe right so Protestants is. typically restrict grace or they only I mean they typically mainly think of it as dispositional in other words God's disposition towards you changing from angry to happy so that's what they're talking about when they use that because they think of it as your judicial standing before God Orthodox typically uh, think of it more so in the sense of the metaphysical thing that you're participating in which is the uh, actual divine life of God. So I have a whole essay, Is Grace uh, Created or Uncreated, here at my website if you want to watch that. There's also uh, dire clips versions of it. So if you want a deeper dive into specifically where we're, say, uh, departing from the uh, Roman Catholic view, it's here. And then I have an old, old essay that I wrote about... Uh, <coughs> Contrasting our view to to the Calvinist view, because in the Calvinist view, grace uh, kind of ultimately it is dispositional, but it's dispositional because of the merits that Jesus does to fulfill the covenant of works. That's the Calvinist view. So in other words, the uh, Adam failed to do all the good works. So Jesus, as the second Adam, has to come and fulfill this, quote, covenant of works, which then merits the uh, perfect judicial standing which is then imputed to your bank account that's the classical protestant calvinist view so the problem with the uh uh merited uh, works and time that jesus does to fulfill the covenant of works is that it's still a it's still a created grace 
So they're in the exact same position as the official uh, Ludwig Ott Roman Catholic position that grace is a supernatural, quote, creature. In other words, it's Arian. So when Palamas okay, debates right with Barlium, also- yeah. When Palamas debates Barlium about created grace, he says, well, the- so ultimately you're saved by another creature. That's Arian. Also, I just wanted to, I got, uh, I believe it's uh, Instant Verbum. He had a, a really good clip of yours. It's my favorite dire clip. Um, he he resurrected it, so to speak, the, uh, the other week. It's called The General Resurrection of Mankind. Oh, yeah. If you guys yeah. haven't heard that, that is so good. So, so anyways, thanks, Jake. Yeah, I think the old essay that I'm thinking of, I think it's this one. It's called um, How Calvinism is Nestorian and Pelagian. I think this is the essay I'm thinking of from like 2010. So I'll put this in the chat for you guys. Uh, That's one. And then, um, yeah, I forgot about that video that was on in Sitium Verbum from like six years ago. Uh, I'll put that in the chat for you guys too. Let's see, General Resurrection. I don't know. How is uh, Kotel going to talk about the Moscow thing on YouTube? That's crazy. I mean, I, I'm not saying it's crazy that, that he's doing it. I'm saying that, like, is he going to get away from it? <laughs> like, how is he going to do that? Like, I just assume that, like, there ain't no way you can talk about that on YouTube. Let me see. I just saw that video the other day pop up. Uh, where's it at? Oh, is that it right there? Yeah, here it is. So here's the video that he's referring to, um, which I do think is, now that I think back to which video this is, I think this is pretty good for like Protestant Calvinist uh, mindset there. <clears throat> All right, we got a few more we'll do. Um, I might try to do another stream. To, I'm, I'm in straight up like machine mode, dude. Like I'm ready to live stream the crap out of myself in the next few weeks. I mean, I'm just, I don't know. Something has... Uh, uh, something crawled up in me and got me all whacked out, bro. Uh, Slay Bubbles. What's up, Slay Bubbles? Jamie, could you make me a double shot? Thank you. What's up, Slay Queen? Hello, Jay Dyer. Uh, I'm on my girlfriend's account. Uh, God bless you. I want to just thank you for everything you do. Thanks, man. Um, I appreciate that. I have, I have a question about... Um, Counting by division and Bo Branson's uh, unity of action. I mean, is it the same uh, answer to the quote unquote problem, or is it two different and two different answers to the same problem? How does it compare? Or, I mean, how are they similar? In- Arguments that's made is that uh, following um, uh, William Lane Craig and, and another guy, I, I, I read the, the Dr. Branson's response essay uh, like a month ago. So I, I forget all the details in that, but. Unity of action has to do with whether or not there's one will and operation in the Trinity versus each of the persons having their own will and action. And so the the William Lane Craig Apollinarian conclusions, if I recall, lead him to thinking that there's like three wills in God or something like that. I, I may not be remembering the details, but that's different from how we count. And I have a, I did a whole video on my uh, backup channel, if you want to see that, where I, I basically just walk through two different ways of counting. They're not exclusive. Different things are counted in different ways. So in the ancient world, they typically counted by division. This is why the Nicene Creed talks about God as, a, or excuse me, the, the liturgy speaks of God as undivided. That means counting by division. Uh Al-Ghazali in his uh, Belief in Moderation, section 8 or so, he counts by division, 8 or 10. Uh, Aristotle in the categories, 6, counts by division. Uh, It's well known. It's not even a contentious issue. So the point, though, is that different things are picked out and counted in different ways. That's So if you want a fuller explanation of that, it's on my backup channel, just called Counting by Division. Okay. Thank you for that. I just have a another question basically so it would with, with that being said counting by division um i've heard luigi ask you the same question but i just want to make sure that i'm you know positive on this so it would be basically uh, just denying the false dichotomy of is of identity and is of predication correct it's related to that but it's just pointing out that not everything is counted in the same way so uh 
like when we okay. count oh, go ahead no okay no because you know that's how you know you know muslims will ask is jesus god by predication or by identity but with you, what you're saying is just basically like rejecting that saying we count by division well that this is more so related to the trinity or what's called the logical problem of the trinity so this is yeah. it's not really uh uh I mean, it's related to Christology, but hold on a second. I'm trying to find this video, so let me find it. Oh, man, this freaking search never. Maybe Kyle put it up. Now I can't remember. Uh, can't remember where I put it. Anyway, it's this live stream talk here. You just have to find it with our causes. Or you... It's like a <coughs> three-hour live stream from debating lunatics on TikTok. <coughs> um, let's see. Jub, he timestamped it, so let me see where that timestamp is. Here it is. So if you go to 144... Yeah. Oh, brother. <coughs> if you go to 144 in this talk right here, it's called... Uh, insane TikTok debates, atheists, Calvinists, and cults. Uh, if you go to 144, I, I walk through the two different senses of how we count. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, man, good questions. Thank you. God bless you. You too. Uh, Richard Hayes. By the way, look uh, look for Tristan and I to do a uh, deep dive on Dune and Dune 2. That's going to be fun in the next few days over on his channel, or I think tomorrow. So uh, beautiful Tristana and I will be discussing Paul Mwadib Usul Atreides and uh, his uh, Nestorian ascent to being the hand of God. <laughs> the, vo the voice from the outer world. Um so anyway, you gotta unmute, man. I mean, you ain't, you ain't gotta unmute. You don't. You can just uh, not unmute. Whatever. So uh, we got it. Some we got several super chats I need to read. We got a couple more uh, questions coming up. But before we do that, I want to remind you guys that we do have a show sponsor. Check out this awesome based red pill company that will make you 100% toxically masculine beyond your wildest dreams. I'm gonna put you on something crazy real quick. Most of these Zoomer gym bros are consuming macro guzzling synthetic dyes and synthetic sweeteners on the daily. They don't even know it. Goofy AF. There's nothing great about that. Do not listen any further unless you are an alpha or sigma male. This is important and there could be consequences. There's a new certified sigma male pre-workout powder for sigmas only. It is guaranteed to empower you to dominate your co-workers, fire your boss, aggressively gamble, or invade a small village. Chad Mode stands out from the crowd by excluding artificial flavors, preservatives, sweeteners, and dyes. We've even avoided so-called natural flavors, which are actually not natural at all, ensuring a clean and effective formula. Experience the pure goodness of Chad Mode, colored with organic blue spirulina extract organic lemon, cherry, and organic maple crystals. Forget synthetic caffeine made in a sketchy Chinese lab. Embrace the natural power of organic green coffee bean extract, which will get your mind going and pump you up to the max. Chad Mode is made in America with all clean ingredients, the first clean pre-workout of its kind. Why are these people adding synthetic sweeteners to every single pre-workout when there are many studied downsides to consuming nasty fake sucralose? Each dose of Chad Mode contains the kick of a cup and a half of coffee, delivering a surge of energy. Shout out to Vivek Ramaswamy on the ads there, uh, keeping us uh, red pill based and toxically masculine. <clears throat> no, that's not actually... Vivek, for those that are wondering, <clears throat> that's AI Vivek, according to our awesome chalk ads. So use the promo code J50 over at chalk.com. By the way, chalk doesn't just have the uh, amazing, awesome Chad mode. That's one of their new products. They also have my favorite, the Tonkat Ali, which is proven to boost testosterone. 100% proven to do that. Go read the studies over at chalk.com. C-H-O-Q.com. 
Action 2.0, you want to boost those energy levels. Well, if you head over to chalk.com, you'll see the male vitality stack right there on the front screen. You don't pay that full price. You pay half of that with the promo code J50, that's JAY50, to get 50% off. And we got uh, uh, we got a couple people <clears throat> left in the queue. I'll go to those. Hey, Jay, I missed you. Can oh, it's I okay. Step in? Sure. Yeah, I uh, sent a super chat a while ago, but I missed it. I had to go pick up my uh, son from school. I was saying I was new to orthodoxy. I was trying to figure out, like, what's the uh, best translation of the Bible to use. And the context was kind of like, oh, I thought, like, the uh, King James was, like, the best. It's based on Septuagint, da, da, da. No, uh, what you want is the... Luther trying to modify it. No, dude, what you want... Mm -mm -mm. No, no, no. You want the women's rights gender-neutral study Bible. That's the best study Bible that's out there right now. What's that? I'm just joking, man. There, I think there is a gender neutral study Bible which somebody put out. Like, uh, I think it was like one of these cucked Nordic countries put out a gender neutral study Bible. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding, man. Uh, the the Orthodox study Bible is my favorite. So. Uh, okay, so the OBS basically, okay, or OSB. Got it. Oh, there is. So you actually, there's a whole. You can actually choose a whole plethora of gender neutral translations of the bible this is so insane anyway yeah uh orthodox study bible is my uh my my recommendation i've used it for many years um a lot of really good notes they're not perfect notes um sometimes it's a little weak in areas of the old testament which i wish they could have done more on uh, and every now and then i think they make a, a few theological missteps in the notes but i'd say 95 percent of the notes are really good in the orthodox study bible uh let's see, let's go to uh, who's up next? Renzo. What's a Renzo? Sounds like a sounds like some kind of a gangster movie name. Like the you're the underling to one of the gangsters. Hello, Jay. What's up, Renzo? All right. What's up, Jay? I have a question. So basically, um, uh, I'm a, I'm inquiring about Orthodox, and I was wondering. So, do what's the main difference in the Trinity, like? I'm, I'm into the Christology stuff, so like along the lines of like the economy I heard you talk about before, like like is the origin origin with the Father or both the Father and the Son? Like I, I'm into this. So I can no, the or- like, Orthodox hold strictly to the Father as the sole origin and cause. Uh, Roman Catholics believe through via Lyons and Florence that the Son also is a co-source with the Father together as a single source. Uh, of the uh, hypostatic personal origin of the spirit. So we do not believe that. That's the key uh, filioque difference. Um, and by the way, we have we have several you know debate reviews. You can go watch the debate reviews of, of our uh, filioque debates. We have a three-hour talk on the Edward Sashinsky book uh, about the filioque. So. <clears throat> okay, so what would be some like beginner books you would <laughs> the, uh, about the as, as, well, if you're asking about the filioque issue, I would say read the Sashinsky book. But if you're asking about orthodoxy in general, I think uh, probably my endorsed book, The Orthodox Church, is a good introduction. Okay, thank you. That was it. Yeah, man, great questions. Uh, glad to hear that you're inquiring. Um, now, Harry, I'm not. Uh, remember, we're on YouTube, so let's keep uh, our questions, Mr. Ludwig. Um, YouTube af- appropriate so that we don't get boosted, blasted off of YouTube. You gotta unmute. Hello. Yes, sir. Looking forward to volume three and your previously uh, mentioned uh, book on on the on, on the books that anyways anyways uh, I was wondering what you uh, if you've read Rush Dooney's The One and the Many and what's your take on that I have yeah in fact I've recommended it for, for many years um, obviously I disagree with Rush Dooney's like theology but uh, I thought that his One and the Many book is a great application of the problem to um, the history of social order. So basically, for those that don't know, uh, Rush Uni takes the the issue of the one of the many and says we can actually see in the history of cultures and civilizations 
the manifestation of the problem of the one the many in terms of how societies are organized. So yeah, I read it uh, back in the 2000s and I've always thought it was a pretty good book. So you think he deals with, uh, he elevates the Trinity as a, as a crucial thing in the history. Anyways. Yeah, I would agree with that. Have, yeah. you, have you read any Vern Poitras? Yes, I read uh, Shadow of Christ and Law of Moses. Okay. Let me think. He has another. Yeah, he, I, I read another book uh, from Poitras. Uh, something about sacraments back in the day, but I, I, I don't. I mean, that was a long time ago. Okay. Well, take care. Say hi to Jamie. Yeah. See you. And uh, yeah, I, th I thought actually there was some good uh, typological um, argumentation in Poitras's uh, Shadow of Christ and the Law of Moses. So. Uh, even though he's Calvinist, I would disagree with the Calvinist theology. Um, that's a pretty good book on uh, typology. So let's see. Dan Burdorf. What's up, Dan? Are you there? BMX 1966, 10 bucks. Thank you so much, BMX. Appreciate that, guys. If you want to support the show via Streamlabs uh, Super Chat, you can. So if you want to send me a Super Chat, you use uh, Streamlabs right there, the Super Chat link. Hopefully everybody saw, once again, um, the points that were made today uh, via critiquing Trent. This was really what the debate with Trent ultimately was about. If you remember when Trent and I debated natural theology, unfortunately today Trent sort of restated all the same uh, mistakes from two years ago so that's what kind of uh, got me fired up ready to to live stream today so hopefully you understood and grasped all that uh auntie pacman three dollars are you unequivocally absolutely beyond a shadow of a doubt ten thousand percent sure that you're not mean no in fact i tricked you all by telling you that 2024 would be the year of love you all believed it and then i showed up with my Cobra Commander shirt, as you see here today. So, you are all fooled by Cobra. There you go. You bought into Cobra Commander's PsyOps hook, line, and sinker. Sean, $2. Can Constantinople be permanently excommunicated? Uh, sure. Uh, any of the seas could be. Ca uh, Canon 28 of Chalcedon makes New Rome uh, next to the privileges of Old Rome. Does that have to be linked to Constantinople thinking about the possible reunion of 2025. Well, look, if we believe old Rome can be uh, severed and lose its candlestick, then certainly new Rome can. Um, so absolutely. Sean, $2. YouTube notified me that Jim Bob is live, but it doesn't notify me about you even when I turn the notifications on. Yeah, who knows? You never, you never predict this stuff. But uh, remember, everybody, that you also do have to turn on notifications. So sometimes maybe that gets turned off. I don't know exactly. Maybe in your phone you turn off notifications under apps or something. I'm not saying you did that. I'm just saying that sometimes that can happen. Um, you don't even have the live symbol. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I, think, it, I think it says I'm live on YouTube. But, yeah, who knows? Could be, could be any of that. Uh, I think... I noticed that engagements on Twitter seem to have gone down in the last month. So um, that's odd. Marinkus man, $5. Uh, I'm picking out a different referent versus, what's the, wait, picking out a different referent versus, for example, just being wrong. For example, if I point at Jay Dyer and say that you don't have a human will, I'm, real, but I'm wrong, but I'm still talking about Jay Dyer. That's true, but... The problem is that in in terms of knowing conceptually about God versus worshiping and, and having adoration with God, that's why I use my analogy of having a, a, a relationship and adoration, right? So remember, if, if Nostra Aetate had restricted it to uh, Muslims have a knowledge of the person of God, god via abraham or something like that. maybe they could skate around that but the problem is that they say that they adore the one true god 
and have the faith of Abraham. No, they don't. You see, that's, that's the problem there. So are they talking about a different Jesus or what? Yeah, that's my point, right? So again, if I, if I, let me, if I say Jesus, I believe, like Job's Witnesses, they quote, believe in Jesus. Mormons believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Do me, a Jehovah's Witness, and a Mormon, therefore, all have the same referent? Kinda. Because even though they might intend, quote, Jesus, it's totally wrong. And so the referent doesn't achieve the worship and adoration, as Vatican II says, you see. So knowing, it's, it's equivocating on the word knowing, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, I forgot to talk about Acts 17. This is a great example of this. So let's go to Acts 17, where... <clears throat> Where uh, Trent, uh, he, he brought this up today, Acts 17. So let's look at this. <clears throat> because again, we're going to see that Acts 17 doesn't say what Trent wants it to say. It says the exact opposite of it. And this is relevant because here's where, and Dan, I apologize, we'll go to you in just a second. Uh, this is where the, the apologetic of St. Paul confronts the, uh, the Greek philosophers. So Paul walks into... Athens to the marketplace and he says that there were certain uh, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers and uh, he reasoned with the Jews and the Gentiles the worshipers in the synagogue by the way that means he's debating so debating's not wrong the Stoic philosophers and Epicureans said what is this babbler talking about everyone and typed that Wendy's made the official hamburger of March Madness a buck yeah! what the heck Where's Where's that from? on another level oh that's a stupid ad on the Bible gateway page I'm like what the heck is Black people talking about food in my mind. I'm, am I going crazy? I got altars talking to me. Uh, they brought him to the Areopagus. What is this doctrine? So we'll skip down here to where Paul addresses the Areopagus. And Paul says, uh, I was passing through your objects of worship. And I noticed that you had a bunch of statues and all kinds of things. And I even found an altar that says to the unknown God. Now, in my mind, this example is a perfect example of the point that I've been making. My position. Okay. Trent, I don't know why he thought this proved his position, but therefore the one God who you worship without knowing. Okay. So notice that there's two senses of knowing here. And worship here does not mean that the worship is accepted. And the problem with the Vatican II passage is the wording makes it sound as if it is accepted. Muslims worship the one God, you say. Because of what? Because of, quote, the faith of Abraham? But it's not the faith of Abraham. Because the faith of Abraham is not based on genetic descent, as Paul says. It's based on belief in the Messiah, which neither Jews nor Muslims have. So the entire letter of the Galatians refutes this idea that there's some faith of Abraham separate from the faith of Christ. No, there's not. And you can't have one without the other. Okay. So let's go back to Acts 17. <clears throat> That's the, the one that I proclaim to you. Now, if they already knew God, then Paul doesn't need to, what, what message does he need to bring? If they already know God in a potentially saving relationship via their altar, which actually reads unknown God. Okay. What does this say right here? Unknown God. We are worshiping what we don't know. So that means that they're not really worshiping the living God. Otherwise, why does Paul need to bring a message to them if they're already worshiping God? So this is the, Trent's whole point is undercut by the point of the passage. Paul is preaching to people who don't know God in a saving way. And you say, well, then what's the problem with the Muslim text? Because this gives the impression that it is a saving way. They adore the one God. They have the faith of Abraham and submit to Abraham, submit to God like Abraham. No, they don't. That's the point. And the whole move of Trent and company to get to what Nostra Tate, Vatican II says right here in this text, is natural theology, misinterpreting passages like this. God who made the world and everything in it, since he's Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hand. Oh, so wait a minute. 
So he's not actually worshipped according to the ignorant worship of these people. Do you see this? So there's two different senses of knowing and worshipping. This first sense that you worship without knowing, Paul is rhetorically saying you don't actually worship him and he doesn't accept this worship. He's not worshipped with men's hands. Yet you pagans who, quote, worship him unknowingly, do worship him with men's hands, and that is not true worship. He has made from one, since he gives life to everything, he's the creator, he's not a creature. He has made from one every blood, uh, every nation, every blood, every tribe to dwell on the face of the earth. He has predetermined their appointed times and boundaries and dwellings, so that they should seek him in the hope that they might find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. For we, as some of your poets have said, are also his offspring. So Paul is saying that there is a kind of primordial, uh, you could say, quote, monotheism there. But the primordial monotheism is, first of all, not obtained through idolatry. That's his point there. And all the nations became idolatrous, you see. So the idolatrous errors and heresies are deviations that prevent the true relationship with God. And if you read John Damascus' heresiology, this is why he calls idolatry a heresy. He says the original heresy is Genesis. The fall is the original heresy. Well, wait a minute, how could that be a heresy? Because it was a fall away from the Trinity in the Garden of Eden. That's why John Damascus can class every error, whether idolatry, heathenism, atheism, as heresies and deviations from the original Trinitarian worship in the garden. How different is that from everything that Trent says? So, this passage has nothing to do with Trent's natural theology. Paul is actually saying that you're a bunch of idolaters and you've made the divine nature into something that it's not. And then he says, uh-oh, you were what? Ignorant. Now, wait a minute. If they're ignorant, then how were they Worshipping the one true God. So, again, this, I think, really demolishes the opposite reading that Trent tried to give it in his uh, citations today on Twitter. Uh, Dan, did you want to say something? Dan, are you still there? Uh, it says you're here, but I can't hear you. Did you turn your mic on? Are you, are you there? So, Dan, if you want to come out, come back in, go to try to maybe turn your mic on or something. We don't hear you. Uh, let's see. Dion. What's up, Dion? Dion, the Bible guy. You got to unmute. Hello? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so, I'm reformed, uh, but I've been listening to you for a while. Um, I'm watching a lot of your videos, and I think... Um, you, you make a lot of good points when it comes to, for example, the Trinity and like penal substitutionary atonement. And so I've been calling a lot of, you know, pastors and reform guys, popular people, uh, trying to like, you know, harmonize this all out. So I, I guess I'm just curious, what would, how would, how do you understand Isaiah 53 10, where it says it pleased the Lord to crush him, to crush the son? Because that seems to be a general verse that reform guys go to. Yeah. So I'm just curious how, what you sure. think about that. Yeah, and and uh, to be clear, in Orthodox theology, we do accept there is an element of penal uh, uh, punishment or, in a sense, also substitution. But we have to be very precise because it's not penal substitution as the classic Reformation teaching teaches it. So is there any uh, representation substitution element? Yes. Is there any quote, punishment element, yes. And so let me show you what the classic Orthodox teaching is. If you go to uh, On the Orthodox Faith by John Damascus, uh, book three, let me pull it up for you. <clears throat> and if you read the last, uh, it's like five, the last five paragraphs of book three. So if we scroll down here to what happened when Christ died, you'll see that John Damascus gives the perfect explication of our view. Um, I also have on my Rockfin, I did a 
two-hour live talk at an Antiochian Orthodox event um, about Christ's descent into Hades, where I also cover this uh, this uh, issue. You have to you have to search on my Rockfin for uh, descent into Hades, comma J Dyer, and it'll come up. Um, but if we scroll down here to his prayer. This is the appropriation. So the first part is chapter 25. This is where John of Damascus really starts to answer the, the reformed questions. And here he says that, first of all, uh, God the Son was perfect. So he can't literally become a curse. But he says that it, he, be, he became as if one cursed, right? And so there's no literal sense in which the Father is damning or rejecting the Son. He's cursed from the appearance of humans. From human vantage point, it appears, okay, this man over here, he's being uh, crucified. That's a cursed dude. He's not literally cursed. But what does it mean then that he's, in a sense, quote, punished or takes on the, quote, punishment? Punishment is the death that he endured, meaning the severance of his human soul from his human body. There's no punishment that is from the vantage point of the father to punish the son in some judicial way because the son always loves the father and can never and the father always loves the son there can never be a division between the two hypostases i mean just think about how silly this would be in terms of eternal generation so does he stop generating the son when he suddenly doesn't love the son anymore when he gets mad it doesn't work that way so what does it mean that there's some sort of uh, acceptance of forsakenness or so forth, this 22nd Psalm. It's explained by John of Damascus very perfectly that the word of God, the Son, willfully accepts the death in his flesh. And the death is not spiritual death. It's the severance of the human soul from the human body. And so John of Damascus will explain that. This is precisely, by the way, why he descends into Hades, because he's the second person to the human soul. He's the, the divine person of the word who is the person to the human soul that descends into Hades. Yeah, no, I, that's actually kind of where I've been. That's kind of where my understanding has gone. Is It's not some type of direct, like, I, it's not like the father is having like this, oh, like angry right. at the Jesus, right? in heaven but it's i'm just understanding it that the father is allowing the son to be crushed so it's like an indirect cause and no, the, the, the crush the crushing is the son's willful acceptance of death it is not spiritual death it is death as in his soul being severed from his body right that's it no, exactly exactly and and the father is in agreement with that mm -hmm. um so yeah, I'm, I'm well, with you on that. So look, this is the prayer in the garden, right? So the, the prayer in the garden is, if you read uh, Maximus the Confessor's little book against Pyrrhus, it's called Disputation with Pyrrhus. The whole debate ends up being about what's happening in the prayer uh, in Gethsemane. And when Jesus says, not my will be done, but thy will be done, the divine person of the Son is submitting his human will to the divine will of the Father, which he shares with the Father. So he's... He, he is determining to submit the human will that he possesses to accept death. And what is death there? It is not spiritual death. How could the divine person of the Son have a spiritual death? This would split the Trinity. He's a divine person. He's not a human person. That's Nestorianism. So the death that he's willfully uh, accepting can only be death in his flesh, namely his human nature, the severance of the human soul from the human body. Yeah, and if, if there was anybody that ever said that, like, Jesus, the Son, like God, experienced some type of spiritual death, like, that's crazy. I would no, that's all. The, that. That's Luther says that. Calvin says that. The Puritans say that. John Murray says that. Uh, Charles Hodge says that. That's very common in the classical ref reformers. Okay. I mean, I've been looking it up. I haven't been able to find, like, direct sources. I'll, for it, show, you, I'll show you this. I'll show you a catena of uh, quotations right here. <clears throat> because uh, my buddy, uh, old Catholic buddy, um, he compiled a bunch of these like 12 or 13 years ago. And it ha he has all the sources too. So it's, I think it's called, uh, hopefully it's still up. Yeah, here it is. Was Jesus Damned in Your Place? Uh, Nick's blog. And he cites uh, a bunch of John Piper, Lorraine Bettner, the famous Calvinist, John MacArthur, uh, let's see, he's got uh, Charles Hodge, Systematic Theology, Calvin Institutes of the, uh, the Christian Religion, J.I. Packer, Wayne Grudem, 
Um, Luther says it too. I don't know if he has Luther in this in this uh, collection, but Luther does say it. So, and they actually call it spiritual death. It's damnation. We, okay, and this is okay. So I've I called a few people today, and I was talking to them about that, and I'm aware that they use words like damnation and stuff, but like what I, what people have been explaining to me, and I've talked to quite a lot of people, is that. It is. It does have to do with his death on the cross. It's not some type of like eternal damnation. Like it's it's more of well. Like I mean, what 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 is separation is. from what is separation from God? Luther says that in that instant he experienced. So what Luther does is he reinterprets the phrase in the creed that he descended into Hades. Luther says the descent into Hades doesn't mean that he literally went to a realm of the dead called Hades. It means that he experienced in that instant all of the torments and damnation of the father from all eternity in that instant. And Luther says he can do that because he's God. Hmm. So yeah, I'm going to have to check out those. Well, I've, I mean, I've got I, it right I, here. I I've got it pulled up, bro. It's right here on oh, the screen. I, I, I can't see it. Um, do you want to uh, here? Let me read you uh, Luther treatise on preparing to die. So then sure. gaze at the heavenly picture of Christ who descended into hell for your sake was forsaken by God as one eternally damned when he spoke uh, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani. That's Luther right there. Tr treatise on preparation for death. Yeah, yeah, I would, I couldn't, I would, I could never accept that. But Well, it's anti-Trinitarian. So, it's crazy. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. That's what I'm saying. Like these, that argument that you use against what some of those reformers said, like I would, I would agree with you on that. So could, what would you say if I were to affirm, you know, kind of what you explained earlier about, you know, a type or a form of substitution atonement. If I were to affirm that, I mean, isn't that in a sense a type of sub penal substitutionary atonement? It's just not. It just depends on what you mean by the words. Damage. It just depends on what one means by the words. But the whole key to understanding this issue is actually Christology. Once you figure out, if you read the John McGuckin book, St. Cyril of Alexander, The Christological Controversy, it will get rid of all of the uh, Protestant ideas that you might have or the Roman Catholic ideas that you might be tempted with. Because once you get um, Cyrilline Christology down and you understand that the divine person of the word is the only subject, it's not possible for any of these Protestant positions. Yeah, I'm going to have to check that book out. The mm -hmm. last thing... Um, it's so it's kind of a two part thing. So do you, do you believe that God experiences emotions or like how does does God experience emotion? I mean it's probably not going to be like we do, but does he experience joy or anger or things like that? Well, we typically call those uh, divine energies, and so I don't think we would equate them to human emotions. I mean, we're told that God is not a man like a man who changes his mind. So, um not in the in his divinity, no, but in the sense of the revelation in Christ, because Christ took on human nature. In that sense, yes, he really does cry. He really does have love. He really does, you know, experience uh, uh, human emotions and so forth. Okay, because I was going to say the uh, the last thing I was going to bring up is also in Isaiah fifty three, where it says our sins were placed upon him. Well, I mean, the Bible says that. Like God hates sin. Uh, not that the Father is going to hate the Son because our sins yeah, were but, put on Him. Yeah, but, but God, we, we don't worship, like, right? So, but God is not like Zeus, right? We don't worship a God who uh, is this tyrant in the sky who's constantly getting mad and getting upset. I mean, that's like a, that's a that's an anthropomorphic error. So, okay. um, God doesn't experience the passions. He's not fallen. Okay. So those are terms, it's, it's uh, anthropomorphic terms that try to tell us and explain to us how God is. But no, God's not actually sitting around like super mad and angry. It's just, it's human language that's trying to tell us about the divine. Um, but when it says, for example, uh, he placed, I mean, let's think about this for a minute. Like sin and evil, you understand that they don't have being or substance. Right. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah, it's, it doesn't have a... Like okay, a so, so there can't experience. actually... So there's not literal... Jesus can't literally become sin. Right. <laughs> because sin's not a thing. Okay, so if that's the case, then when what Isaiah is saying, it, it can't mean that... Like, remember in the in, when the Jews would place their hands on the, uh, the scapegoat, 
Like, do they literally put sins on the scapegoat? It's, no. it's right. No, they're, so, they're treating them as if they're sinful. They're right. giving them the consequence of sin. Which so is that's pr- exactly that's appropriation. And so, in the same way, when John of Damascus is explaining in what sense Christ became a curse or it became sin, it's by appropriation. It's as if he was one cursed, but he's not cursed. And the Father never ceases to love the Son. And so, the language about uh, punishment and so forth and chastisement is not because the father is unjust and uh, punishes a his son unjustly. No, 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 it's explained as the son willfully doing these things. He didn't have to do these things. He willed to do those things. Sure. Fair enough. No, and he willed, to do the, yeah, he willed to do these things for our healing. So, yeah, great questions. Let's see. Dan, what's up? I don't know, Dan. I still can't hear you, so I don't know if you didn't turn your mic on or what, but we can't hear you. So now there's like eight people want to chat now that I'm, I'm about done. <laughs> so um, did we get any more super chats? Let's see here. Um, let's see. Next one. Shane Pava, $25. Thank you so much. I watched the three-hour-plus video on John... Oh, you mean like the Gospel of John talks? And the three out... There's there's not a one three-hour video on John. I've lectured through the whole Gospel of John. So that if you missed it, there's actually a lecture on every chapter of John. Um, and then the three-hour video on Rocking Mr. E. Thank you so much. Kanez, $5. Do you think that most church fathers say physical intercourse is a result of the fall? Is this mandatory uh, Orthodox teaching? I don't know of... I don't know if most do. Uh, if, if you want to ask somebody who would know that better than me, uh, Father Deacon Patrick that I interviewed on uh, Deacon S's, he would probably know that question better than me. Um, there is dispute. Even the Father Sephram Rose in his Genesis Creation Early Man book mentions um, patristic disputes about whether uh, sexuality, biological you know, differences, whether that entered as a result of the fall or not. Um, I don't think it did. Uh, I, I mean, and so there's there's some patristic dispute here. I think Genesis is pretty clear that men and women are men and women before the fall. Uh, so I think that the Cappadocians and even St. Maximus uh, did make some uh, mistakes here. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, $5. What do you think about John McGuckin? Uh, I, I only recommend the Cyril book, um, but I think that he's gone pretty liberal, so I wouldn't recommend much more. Doug, $20. I'm new to orthodoxy. What's the Bible translation that you recommend? Uh, yeah, I, I think the Orthodox Study Bible is the best. I think you called in. DC will work in $3. Thank you so much. Anonymous $5. Let us make. If this is speaking of the angels, would that also mean that the angels created us? Uh, actually, yeah. Some of the, the people that propose the idea that it's a Unitarian deity that's creating are will, would then seemingly give angels a creative power. Uh, and so I think some of them would actually bite the bullet and say, yeah, the angels co-created us as well. And this ends up kind of moving into Neoplatonism. So Neoplatonic ideas, kind of, you kind of have creation not being a direct uh, thing from God or the monad. It's more of a like a, 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 a series of ontologically uh, diminished emanations. And so nothing would directly come from the first principle you would have to have these kind of gradations of lower principles of the dyad and the triad, and that that's where you would get the uh, the elements that make up the cre- the the beings in our dimension. Uh, I think even um, I think even Egyptian theology has this view, and that's why you'll you'll if you look at like Egyptian metaphysics and whatnot, like they think that like one of the principles. Uh, is like the principle behind uh, femininity, right? So there's a goddess of femininity, uh, Nuit or whatever, and so she's responsible for that domain of creation, right? So that's kind of a Neoplatonic, and I think Egyptian view. Uh, Anthemos of Bulgaria, $5. Isaiah 7, 14, is this about Christ and also a contemporary event 
in Isaiah. I think so. I think it's in Isaiah. There was something, a lot of the uh, Messianic prophecies uh, tend to be um, events that were occurring uh, at, at that time and something future Messianic. So there's always this mirroring going on. So I think Isaiah, right, probably had a, an offspring, but that event, of, and I'm not saying Isaiah's offspring was a virgin birth, but that event typifies something in the Messianic period. Um, let me give you an example of this. Isaiah 19 has a, a, a discussion, for example, of this proclamation against Egypt. Now, this is something relevant to, in terms of the, what we call the grammatical historical interpretation. The immediate grammatical historical referent is what's happening in Isaiah's day in regard to a prophecy against Egypt. Okay, so we see this. However, uh, as the prophecy progresses, we get this interesting statement here that there's a coming day where five cities of the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan, that is, of Israel. One will be called the city of destruction. Look at this. In that day, there will be an altar to Yahweh in Egypt. Now, wait a minute. How could the... This is post-temple, right? The only lawful temple in the Old Testament period is where? Jerusalem. You can't go set up your own altar. Uh, when, Re when Jeroboam sets up his own altar, he's condemned for this, right? Because when Israel splits, the northern tribes and the southern, uh, the, the ten tribes and then Judah, the lawful place of worship is the southern tribe of Israel. I mean, Judah, excuse me. Well, being a crafty statesman, Jeroboam knows that he can't let Israel's worship be in the south. That's his enemy. So he concocts the made-up worship of Dan and Bethel. So he makes his own altars, his own temples, which are state-controlled via his cult. This is, by the way, this is like ancient ecumenism. <laughs> uh, of course, he's condemned for this. So how is Isaiah talking about an actual historical prophecy against Egypt? How's he gonna, how could there be ever an altar to Yahweh in Egypt? That's not possible. Ah, but it is possible if this is fulfilled in the Messianic era when the church spreads to Egypt as well as to Assyria and the name of the Lord is called upon in those pagan lands. Imagine how this would have blown Isaiah's mind. How could we have an altar in, in Egypt? This doesn't even seem possible. In that day, there's an altar to the Lord in Egypt, a pillar to the Lord at his border. And it will be for a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in Egypt. For they will cry to the Lord because of the oppressors, because he will send them a savior. So this is a messianic prophecy. Then Yahweh will be known in Egypt. What? And Egyptians will know the Lord and make a sacrifice. And it's almost like it's repeated because they would have had, that, that Isaiah and his audience would have had a hard time believing this. Like what? How will they make a sacrifice and offer? You can't, they can't, are they going to come to Jerusalem? How's that possible? The Lord will strike Egypt and he will heal it. He will be entreated by them and heal them. What? God hates Egyptians, right? You're a Jew. You're thinking God doesn't love them. He only loves us. How could this be possible? In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrian will come to Egypt and the Egyptian will go to Assyria and they will serve God with the Assyrians. What? This will be blowing them. Well, I mean, these kinds of prophecies are probably why they killed Isaiah. You know, the Jews killed Isaiah, right? I didn't even realize we got all these other super chats. I thought there was like two more. So we actually got a whole bunch more. So the, the, the this was to Andy's question about Isaiah. Uh, not Andy, sorry. Anthemos' question about Isaiah 7. And you're asking about the mirror, mirrored principle. Exactly. That's what we're talking about here, this mirrored principle. So notice this. There's the key point. This, this is the killer, the killer text. One of many examples proving this. In that day, Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria. 
Did you hear that? Mind blowing. How could Israel be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, their enemies? A blessing in the midst of the land. The Lord of hosts will say, blessed is Egypt, my people. What? Egypt, my people. Assyria, the work of my hands. Israel, my inheritance. Well, that's exactly what happens when the Messiah comes and his gospel of the kingdom spreads to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to graft them into the covenant. So it's both. Andy, $5. I jumped in late. I'm trying to understand natural theology. Is it based on 1 Corinthians 15, 46? I don't think so. By the way, isn't it funny when they appeal to the Bible for natural theology? Because natural theology is not supposed to be, it's defined as apart from Revelation. So it's ironic when they appeal to Revelation to try to prove uh, natural theology. But the text that they're using don't even prove natural theology anyway. So natural revelation is not natural theology. So uh, no, this has nothing to do with natural theology. Paul talking about the... Uh, Natural first before the spiritual is referring to our biological life in reality, prepare, uh, preparing us for the uh, the eternal life, spiritual reality. Natural theology, again, guys, if you remember, is simply defined as speculating and philosophizing about God using human reason apart from divine revelation. That's all it means. That's what it's defined as by William Lane Craig and John Paul II. So it's not even a contentious issue. And that's what I'm always critiquing. So I don't know why people get so confused over this because... They think that uh, using reasoning is not, no, it's not. That's not what natural theology, using a faculty is not natural theology. Making arguments is not natural theology. And I, I just, it's baffling to me that in the debate, I sent over to Trent the definition of what natural theology is that we would be debating. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. And then in the debate, he's not, doesn't even stick to the, I just, I don't know. so no, it doesn't have to do with the uh, first Corinthians 15, 46. The Messiah is the word in the flesh, Andy says, uh, as the son, correct. At that time, was Yahweh functioning as a son to show people to be his children? Uh, I mean, it wasn't at that time. It was always that case that Jesus came to not just be our example of how to be sons of God, but to actually ontologically make us sons of God. And that's why grace is uncreated. Use promo code J50 says for $3. Is theistic evolution debate between you and inspiring philosophy ever happening i don't think so we haven't talked about it um we decided to you know just kind of make amends and have common uh discourse against uh muslims but he hasn't expressed any desire for any debates on that noah m five dollars if i played devil's advocate if i define god as three persons in one essence how is this different from three human persons well because Human persons exist in a created mode of being. God is uncreated, so the mode of being that God has is not identical to uh, uh, human modes of being. So there's an analogy you could make between the relationship between person and nature and human beings, but the analogies always fall apart when you try to map them directly on in a one-to-one -one correspondence to God. Peter, Paul, and John are three persons who share one human essence. Correct. But they are not, quote, one human. Right, but they are one essence. So that's where the analogy lines up. But because they're three discrete beings, all created analogies will always fall short. And that's why it's called analogical uh, uh, likening and not univocal or equivalent. Univocal predication is what you're asking. So for the, for if we were to say that Peter, Paul, and John were three and one in an identical or univocal sense to the way that God is three and one, then we would believe in three gods. Joseph, $5.00. Open theology is becoming widespread. I don't know why. Um, it's annoying that every debate on this subject is a Calvinist versus somebody like reality is not optional's debate with Matt Slick. It was a very bad debate. Do you know of any Orthodox apologists on this topic? Um, I, I don't think so. I just think it's very standard. I mean, if you were to read any uh, Orthodox theological exposition or patristic exposition of the first seven centuries nobody would deny divine omniscience so the idea that god updates his knowledge with proposition new propositional knowledge which by the way i think jake believes that we didn't actually get to that in uh, the the jake debate but unless i misunderstood his 
Ibn Tamiya, you know, Salafi position or whatever. I'm pretty sure they think that God learns new facts. and It's like he gets a daily upload. So to me, that would be, that's weird, bizarre, uh, of kind of open theism. And to me, it's just a, it's a weird anthropomorphic heresy. Like, why would we think that God gets new downloads of, of information? It's just silly. Uh, I mean, the scripture says many times over that God is omniscient. So it's weird to me. Damascene three dollars. What do you think would happen to the monastery of Elder Ephraim if a schism happens? I guess you mean between uh, Go Arch EP and the the others. I have no idea. I, I don't know. I guess it's uh, possible that some of those groups would leave communion with uh, with the Greeks. Uh, I guess. <laughs> And they would come over to us. I don't know. Amazing Noel, $10. Thank you for helping as an inquiring person looking to looking for the push to convert. Cool. Uh, yeah, I hope you, you know, definitely check out the church, though. Because a lot of people, we don't want to give them misunderstanding or, or, or mislead people into thinking that, like, this is a bunch of intellectual online stuff. No, you have to go and actually join the church. So that you're not orthodox until, you know, you actually go do that. So... And if you're aware you don't have access, I'm not condemning you. That's not your fault. So uh, you you are and can be Orthodox in potentia. <laughs> so, and uh, God knows our hearts. So uh, I wouldn't freak out if you you know are believing Orthodoxy and then you die before you can get to the church. We have a we have a, a consistent tradition of baptism of desire, baptism of martyrdom, and fire and all that. Amazing Noel. Uh, no, that was you. Donuts is five dollars. There's a clip of a heretical bishop named Mar Mari that delves into Christology. You should analyze his errors if you have time. Well, I think uh, Father McHale already did. So, uh, and in his video, kind of went in, in mini viral, I guess, so to speak. Uh, so, guys, if you guys aren't familiar, uh, I'm trying to. Uh, I think it's Living Orthodox. This is his channel, and he did a video. I think he's done two videos now responding to, yeah, here it is. So the first one he got almost 100,000 views on. So first of all, go check out this video here from Father McHale. Uh, and this is a good response to Marmari. Now, a lot of people got mad too because they're like, Woo, how dare you critique this guy? Well, there, I'm sorry, but there are areas and places that he needs to be critiqued. And then everybody's mad because, oh, you're attacking a oh, man of God. It's like, now, look, we're not trying to be mean and whatnot. It's just that if the default, if the theology is we're going to use Christotokos and not Theotokos, sorry, we have to go after that. I'm sorry. It's just we have to. We're bound to our tradition to do that. And I want to remind you guys how awful it is and ridiculous and how ignorant these people are who claim to be these apologists, like, what's this guy's name? Freaking Rocky Balboa of Roman Catholicism over here. I forget his name, but the voice of reason guy who literally sits here telling you that Nestorius is not a heretic. I mean, I, 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 I can't believe that this is where they're at. And, I mean, if you're falling for this, you just, you just, you're just, you're clueless, man. You don't have any idea what's going on. I, I just don't, I don't get it. How could anybody think, especially if you read Ephesus? Oh, Ephesus actually got it wrong. And by the way, multiple councils after Ephesus reaffirmed the condemnation of Nestorius. So this is just mind blowing to me that anyone takes this seriously. That are being used are uh, serious. Um, so uh, the church isn't protected in matters of fact. The church is only protected, only infallible in matters of faith and morals. In the same way that when the Council of Ephesus um, condemned uh, Nestorius as a heretic, we know now, looking back, that the council was actually incorrect. It turns out that Nestorius wasn't a historian, but the council still uh, condemned him as a historian. And he goes on in that clip to talk about more 
errors in the ecumenical councils, not knowing. I mean, imagine thinking that they can't. So I guess uh, maybe Ar Arius wasn't uh, uh, that bad of a guy. Ar their Arius wasn't an Arian, right? You see how silly this is. Opens up the floodgates to every ridiculous heresy uh, making a comeback. And I'm not trying to be mean, but look, watching that debate, I mean, Luigi mopped the floor with this goofball. Anti like yo daddy sister one dollar world religion would religion the apostles by by father Stephen Young be a good book for a Protestant pastor? I've still not read this book. I mean, I'm not trying to be rude. I've seen interviews where he talked about it. I I assume so, but I don't know how good it would be for Protestants. But I mean, I don't think the main issue that Protestants have is like the Trinity. So. I mean, they have a defective view, but I think Protestants are mainly going to be concerned with like you guys worship idols and have pictures and <laughs> have traditions. I mean, I think that's the main thing the Protestants are worried about. Um, back in my right mind, eighty-eight five dollars. Thank you for what you do. I'm a seventy-three-year-old Orthodox grandmother who's learned from you. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate that. L two a five dollars. Can you do your Steve Quayle impression and bring it back? How does he do? Alex, this is Steve Quayle. I want to remind you that the Nephilim are coming through the portals. It's going to be insane. The Illuminati has so many portals now at Ace. How's that? <clears throat> I haven't done... It's almost turning into my Mark Zuckerberg impression, so I have to go listen to some more... Um, uh, I haven't listened to Steve Quayle in a long time, so I've forgotten how he talks. Uh, let's see. We've got a couple more here. Roddy. Rody. What's up, Rody? Rode? Rada? Rode? Hey Jay, uh, so one question related to the thing you mentioned before about um, Christ and uh, his death was the punishment. Uh, so I've always thought about the way he died. I mean, the the the, the actual crucifixion. Um, as a former Protestant, I've always thought that that was the actual punishment. But now that you clarify that, um, I was wanted I wanted to ask you. Why, um, why, uh, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I do understand the whole, uh, the, the, the crucifixion, but in terms of why he needed to suffer that much, was it for uh, other people? I mean, was it to relate to our fleshly suffering? Well, Maximus or says or that all of the sufferings and all of the things that he went through were for our healing. Cause, yeah, so it was okay. nothing that he needed and he didn't have to do anything to pay off the father. God doesn't need anything. There's no payments that we offer to the father. Well, then why would there be an offering of the humanity to the father? Strictly and solely for our healing, as this says. So the offering is what heals and deifies us. So Christ, as Maximus says, going through all of these things is actually crucifying all of the passions. Now, he didn't have, he didn't have blameful passions. He had blameless passions, but his conquering of those passions when we participate in his deified humanity is what gives us the power to overcome the passions, Maximus says. Yeah, yeah, I, I've heard about that because the angles to his sufferings, so many people who could relate to uh, a mother losing uh, her, yeah, her right, child, right. etc., etc. So, so that's why. And also a, a little bit of unrelated uh, question that I've, I've asked uh, around them. Uh, I haven't got like a, a straight up answer. Maybe you could uh, enlighten me on this. <clears throat> so, the the baptism, right? Um, was uh, the Theotokos ever baptized by water? I don't think so, but I've haven't thought of this. And, and and even and even the the apostles, because I mean, there is one verse where it says that uh, hmm. that Christ and the apostles went to John the Baptist and and they baptized and uh, got baptized, something like that. But it's not like <clears throat> it doesn't state clearly that they got baptized by water as hmm. well. Uh, Interesting. I have I'm not thought of this. <clears throat> I, I've I've heard that because they uh, went through Pentecost, they basically got chrismated and got the the Holy Spirit that way. But I've always thought about. I mean, because I'm <clears throat> I'm a, I'm catechumen and I'm a, and I'm a, I'm about to get baptized, uh, God willing, in a couple of months. So I've uh, I've been reading about the baptism, and uh, I've. Uh, 
found that and I was thinking about the, if, if they actually got baptized and I haven't got a reply. I've actually asked a couple of priests and they have also got surprised like you. Hmm. Uh, so maybe, but maybe it's, it's, it's just, it's I mean, simple. so they, 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 yeah, I mean, it's possible, <laughs> right? We don't know. So like Matthew, so, it, you know, baptism is instituted at the end of Matthew 28, at the end of the gospel. Um, so, maybe they were between the end of the gospel and what we see, you know, between that time and Acts 2, maybe, but um, but maybe not. Maybe Christ, for whatever reason, felt that it wasn't necessary since they had been given a direct apostolic succession and Pentecost. I don't know. That's a great question. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, people in the chat are like, something he doesn't know. Dude, there's a lot I don't know. <laughs> and as you get older, you're going to learn more and more and more that you don't know. So I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how many books you've read. As you get older, it's, it, guess what? It's, there's only more that you don't know. So that's the only guarantee I can give you about knowledge as you get older is that you're going to more and more and more and more learn how much you don't know. I, I promise you that. I guarantee you. Uh, and especially when you're like in your 20s. When you're like 25 to 30, that's like the worst time because you think you know everything. you got everything figured out. You don't. I promise you don't. And by the time you're 40 is when you start to realize you don't know everything. So you will you will learn this and change your mind quite a bit from the time you're 25 to for, to the time you're 40. That I can guarantee you. Uh, be, be, I can't pronounce that. I can't even see it all. Vela Bezzi. What's up, dude? You gotta unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, um, I got a question. So I want to preface by saying that I'm pretty new to faith. I'm uh, just getting started in all this uh, theological arguments and stuff. But uh, I got a question about the Quran and the Islamic school of thought on entrance to heaven versus that with Christianity, which talks about salvation and redemption. So I want, I want to know, why do you think specifically that it's more theologically rational that uh, we have a salvation through Christ, as opposed to in the Quran where Allah is telling us to do all of these things to enter heaven? Like he's giving us specific commandments. And then when I speak to Muslims, they also say like, oh, this book is just... It's a book about everything in life. And, you know, Christ, he's leaving you, how to say, he's leaving you without knowledge. He's leaving you without, uh, you just don't know what to do, etc. I want you, I want to know what you think about that. Well, first of all, I would say that um, the the Bible does give you things to do. So that's not, there's a false yeah, equivalence yeah, yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. I, I, I forgot to include that. But I, I just wanted to, to know that specific idea on uh, gaining the salvation through Christ's crucifixion. So. Well, that's part of the story, though. That's not all there is to it. So there's the other elements of it, which include explaining and fulfilling all these Old Testament Messianic prophecies. So uh, I would highly contend with the claim that Islam is a more rational approach because Islam claims to be in continuity with the Old Testament. And it is not. In fact, it const constantly contradicts the Old Testament. So Islam is not consistent with the Old Testament. I did a whole debate with Daniel Hakikachu on that very point. I would recommend go watch that debate to see that fleshed out. But how can I uh, check the claims of the Quran against prior revelation if the claims of the Quran then say that the prior revelation is full of contradictions and errors? You see how this becomes an arbitrary circle. So it's an impossible task if I'm a 7th century uh, Jew, Christian, or, Mos or a Jew or Christian hearing the claims of the Quran that I'm supposed to check these new revelations against the previous revelation. But then when I go to the previous revelation, nowadays all the Muslims say, oh, but it's all corrupt. Any, pro any text that shows up as a contradiction to the Quranic claims are now arbitrarily corrupted texts. So it's a totally arbitrary, uh, you know, move the goalpost position. Uh, so I contend, I totally reject the idea that the Quran is actually rational at all. If you read Gabriel Said Reynolds' book, for example, that I covered in the debate with uh, Daniel Hakikachu, I mean, he points out at least 12 examples where the Quran uh, totally jumbles up 
the previous biblical narratives uh, in about 12 different cases. Okay, so you, you basically think that it's just like some ad hoc claim that the Bible is corrupt, but there's no real basis for that at all. I'm saying that I don't even have to go into whether that is the case or not if the Quran tells me to check the claims of the Quran yeah. against prior revelation. And then when I go to prior revelation, every Muslim says, that's all corrupted and you can't do that. That's nonsense. I got you. But when they speak about the Injil, are they talking specifically about the gospel in the, in the Bible? No, they don't even think, they, they mistakenly thought that it was a book. Oh, you see, wow, that's great. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of stupid things. I mean, it's Islam is ridiculous. Go, go read the fart hadiths. Those are the, my favorites. So there's at least two or three fart hadiths that they have to believe. Uh, I mean, if you want to see how silly it is. Nad, uh, last one here, Nad. What's up, man? I'm not joking about the fart hadiths. Either. Those are real. You got to unmute, man. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I just want to hope you have a blessed fe uh, feast of Annunciation and uh, have a great Lent. And uh, I don't know if this is uh, part of the topic. Uh, maybe it's a bit of a dumb question, but like, what do you think is the historical... Um, reason for all this natural um, natural theology and all this ecumenism that started in this uh, in this uh, Nostra Atete or something uh, like where well, no, <clears throat> well nat natural theology goes back a lot older than Nostra Atate it's just the easiest thing to point to in Roman Catholic you know dogmatic pronouncements to illustrate the point but I mean I mean, yeah, Tom, I, Thomas I mean, Aquinas, in, right? The Roman Catholic Church, uh, <clears throat> as in like pre schism. You cut out, dude. Uh, can't hear you anymore. But <clears throat> so I think that the the real the real basis is uh, Hellenic philosophy, right? And <clears throat> Hellenic philosophy can be good, it can be bad, it can have insights. But <clears throat> I think the the fundamental source of natural theology's mistakes would relate to um, a temptation on the part of people in in, in early, a lot of centuries uh, to give too much love and appreciation to uh, humanistic Greek Hellenic philosophy. So that's the real source of it, in my in my estimation. Uh, one example of this might be the early Logos apologists. And you'll notice they pretty much f fell away. Like they became weirdos. So you had these guys early on <clears throat> who were uh, converts in the first and second century. And I'm just using them as an example. They're not all bad, but um, like Tatian is one example, of the Logos apologists. Now, this is pulling up a bunch of stupid evangelical stuff. That's not what I'm looking for. <clears throat> um, and they're not, so, I mean, I guess you could, you could say that Irenaeus and Justin Martyr are examples of Logos apologetics, but... Uh, Tatian, for example, is one of the early, the early uh, Logos apologists who went bad. <laughs> like, he, he went crazy. Um, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, Tatian, the Assyrian, uh, he, his most influential, influential work was the Diatessaron, Harmony of the Gospels. Uh, well, let's see. He, he got super into, yeah, he was a pupil of Justin Martyr, that's right. Like Justin, Tatian opened up a Christian school in Rome, um, but he ended up going off into Gnosticism with his obsession with philosophy. Also Clement of Alexandria, I forgot. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, who oddly enough is a saint in the Roman Catholic Church, but not in the Orthodox Church. <clears throat> 
Um, Clement also has a hyper obsession with, with Hellenic philosophy that's too much. So I think that's the roots of it. And so it's always kind of there. And I agree with the thesis that most of the seven ecumenical councils are rebutting some dialectical Hellenic assumption. So whether it's eunomianism, Marcionism, because if you read the Radigalwitz thesis, he actually points out uh, Marcion as one of the early proponents of a strict view of absolute divine simplicity. Um, whether it's origin and originism, which is super duper Hellenic philosophy, um, Neoplatonic veneer, you know, Christianity, Neoplatonism with a Christian veneer is what originism is. All the way up until the Christological disputes with even Severus of Antioch, who has a lot of Neoplatonic presuppositions as well in his dialectics. I think that all of this, all of these errors are some form of Hellenic dialectical philosophy. That's the commonality that the seven ecumenical councils are opposing. Even up into uh, iconoclasm, which most people don't know that iconoclasm was Neoplatonic in, in its motivations. And they were relying on origin, actually. So that would, to me, would suggest that the medieval acceptance and kind of fascination with with what becomes natural theology and reasoning about God apart from any reference to divine revelation, even though it might have had at times good motivations, um, it ultimately ends up being bankrupt because it's kind of a temptation where people more and more want to move away from divine revelation and more and more and more kind of um, rely on autonomous reasoning. So that's what I think is the real danger there. And then what we get is these kinds of moves like Nostra Tate does where it's like, well, we're all saying the same thing, aren't we? I mean, when... Marcus Aurelius says logos. That's the same thing that John one's talking about, isn't it? It's the same word, right? Well, so <laughs> it's because it's the same word. Doesn't, doesn't mean it's the same thing. I mean, when I talk to a Mormon and he says, I believe in Jesus and the father and the Holy spirit, he believes something totally different than me, even though it's the same words. So this is really kind of obvious, isn't it? Anyway. All right. Uh, thank you guys for support tonight. Uh, follow me on X right here. As you see, that's my profile. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get up to 100,000. So we're at 64, 65. I feel like I'm uh, my X exposure is kind of like not doing that great lately. So uh, if you would, support me and follow me there on X if you're on X. And uh, head on over to Rockfin, which is a great free speech-based platform as well. My channel is over here at Rockfin J. Dyer. Uh, I do have unique stuff on Rockfin. I have unique stuff on my website for the member section. A lot of the kind of uh, spicier stuff. For example, people said, what about the, the event in Russia? Did you talk about that? Yes, right here. Uh, Russia, Big Nine event. Alex Jones, Jack Posobiec, me. Go read that or watch that, excuse me. I also covered it with Patrick Hankson and Syrian Girl. Uh, you can see... This new podcast that we have right here for members with the comedian Leonardo Joni. We had a great discussion about cancel culture here. Um, for members, it'll be public uh, eventually. But if you want to go ahead and support me and watch it there. Rockfin right there, Jay Dyer. Rockfin, that's in the show description as well. If you want to support uh, Father Dick Ananias, you can also support him by going to Lore Coffee. <clears throat> this is the link right here from an Orthodox coffee maker, Lore Coffee. You can support them and FDA and myself right there in that link if you want to get some straight up orthodox coffee. Otherwise, everybody have a great night. And remember, tomorrow we'll be back with Tristan covering Dune and Dune 2. Tristan uh, says he enjoyed it, so we're going to have a 